Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to the Mythgard Academy. This is our sixth and final session on A Wizard of Earthsea by Ursula Le Guin. This has been a really fun uh, book to discuss, and we have the last two chapters to do here tonight. Uh, last time, as I recall, we got up through the third confrontation, so we got to just about the end of chapter eight. So I think we should be good for tonight. Um, and I hopefully shouldn't even have to keep you extra late in order to get through. But uh, coming up as we are up against the holidays, I did want to make sure to end this on time. Had we been in a different part of the year, maybe instead of making the sessions a little extra long, I would have just added an extra session. But I didn't want to add an extra session th like three weeks after, you know, this one. So just decided to keep it simpler. Uh, and uh, finish it on schedule. So anyway, um, uh, so we're going to get started here in just a second. One last quick reminder uh, by way of um, uh, by way of announcement is uh, just to remember that we are still running our special on gift certificates uh, for Anytime Audit Credits, which uh, make wonderful holiday gifts for folks, friends and family who might be interested uh, in the material that uh, we've covered in all of our various Signum classes. Uh, you just, uh, so we're running a special $75 uh, for a gift certificate and you can give that to your uh, loved one and they can uh, come in and choose any of our courses that they want. So it's you're not just buying a gift certificate for like a particular course, it's, it's for any course. They can redeem it for anything that they want uh, in our catalog. So that, uh, this should be, uh, 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 I know, you know, many people have taken advantage of this uh, uh, for gifts this season. So I just wanted to make sure to remind you that's running through Christmas time. So uh, I hope that you get a chance to check that out if you haven't yet. All right. Um, also, a quick reminder that we're going to be beginning our special extra bonus Mythgard Academy session uh, on out of the silent planet uh, in January. So we're gonna uh, we're gonna be doing that. That should be uh, up on our website, and uh, uh, that's gonna be a lot of fun. It's gonna be another sort of shorter one like this. So uh, between the two of them, between a Wizard of Earthsea and Out of the Silent Planet, it'll actually come pretty close to balancing out one of the volumes of uh, uh, the history of Middle Earth as we've been going through that. And of course, after Out of the si Silent Planet, we will get to. Uh, uh, Morgoth's Ring, which is, of course, a volume of the history of Middle-earth I've been looking forward to for some time. It's uh, one of the most fascinating um, uh, and uh, really cool. So anyhow, um, that's going to be uh, uh, that's going to be a lot of fun. So lots to look forward to in the first half of 2020 uh, here in the Mythgard Academy. Uh, meantime, one last thing before I begin, just a, a brief apology, which I hope um, won't, uh, which I hope will not um, uh, be in effect. <laughs> but I've been struggling with a head cold this week, and uh, there's like a non-zero. I didn't have much voice at all on Monday. Uh, it started coming back yesterday. I made it through exploring the Lord of the Rings, so it got a little bit rough at the end. Uh, so I'm hoping things should be okay tonight. But again, just sort of <clears throat> apologies in advance uh, in case uh, uh, things get difficult by the end here. All right. Um, yeah, Jocelyn, uh, I know that there are a lot of Tolkien uh, fans who have hesitation about uh, C.S. Lewis. That's uh, very normal, uh, and uh, I want to say normal, but certainly not uncommon. Um, and uh, it should be fun. Out of the Silent Planet will be an interesting uh, kind of way in, especially since we just discussed... The Notion Club papers and you know so we did a lot of kind of talking about sort of second or third hand right um, uh, C.S. Lewis's space trilogy especially out of the silent planet and Perilandra uh, so it'll be really interesting in the light of that recent discussion that we had to uh, uh, to go back and actually read out of the silent planet together um, anyway okay so uh, again, that will be starting in January, early January, um, uh, and I think, if I remember correctly, I think the web page for that is already up uh, on the on Mythcard.org. 
So you should be able to see the schedule there, which, of course, I can't remember off the top of my head. Uh, but there it is. Okay. Let us then dig back. So we had, there was one passage in chapter eight that I didn't get to, and that was the realization that Ged has after his third confrontation with the shadow. So you remember, this is the one where he leaps at it and he, he gra- tries to grab it in his hands and finds nothing but air, right? Nothing but air and darkness between his hands and it escapes him and he's not able to go. Uh, he's not able to, to, to keep it. Uh, and certainly his plan B, remember, which was to uh, grab it or let it grab him and then uh, uh, go down into the depths and drown and take it with him, um, is obviously not going to pan out. All terror was gone. All joy was gone. It was a chase no longer. He was neither hunted nor hunter now. For the third time they had met and touched He had of his own will turned to the shadow, seeking to hold it with living hands. He had not held it, but he had forged between them a bond, a link that had no breaking point. There was no need to hunt the thing down, to track it, nor would its flight avail it. Neither could escape. When they had come to the time and place for their last meeting, they would meet. But until that time, and elsewhere than that place, there would never be any rest or peace for Ged, day or night, on earth or sea. He knew now, and the knowledge was hard, that his task had never been to undo what he had done, but to finish what he had begun. Okay, so a couple different things here. One of the things we've been noticing is that his sense of personal relationship, right, with the shadow, um, he knew this was a thing that was hunting him. The Archmage Nemerly had told him that there was some kind of connection between the two of them uh, that was forged by his summoning of it um, when it came. Um, but he's been coming to understand that better. And as he turned to face it and to chase after it, uh, he knew that it couldn't escape and it seemed to not be able to harm him anymore, right? It was coming after him and it was going to destroy him. Um, It almost did, right, when it called out his name and tried to seize him uh, and make a gebeth out of him, Um, uh, you know, when it it was from from within the body of Skior. Um, But he, he noticed already that that couldn't happen anymore. He had been lying helpless right after he was shipwrecked uh, and it could have come and eaten him any time it wanted to and it didn't do that, right? So that's one realization that he's already had is that it, it can't do that now. And here, now the entire chase is done. He was trying to run away from it. Then he was trying to chase after it. And now he realizes he just has to meet it, right? Um, notice the significance so he was neither hunted nor hunter. For the third time they had met and touched. He had of his own will turned to the shadow, seeking to hold it with living hands. He had not held it, but forged, But he had forged between them a bond, a link that had no breaking point. There is no escape from this meeting, right? Neither one of them can run. There's, there's, there's no need for either one of them. It's, it's both unnecessary and pointless for either one of them to either hunt or attempt to flee. Um, the, that bond, which was originally, and remember, the bond was formed, Nemerly says, by the summoning, right? The summoning established his use of power, his misuse of power, really, established the bond between the two of them. Now, by touching it, by seeking to hold it with his living hands, which is almost like it's, it's almost like a much more intimate version of what he did before, right, with the summoning of it. The calling it up and the, 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 the bringing it into our world. He has now sought to, to not exact, not to bring it into himself. He doesn't want to become a Gebeth, right? He doesn't want it inside of him. Um, but he has, he has forged that this even more intimate connection, this bond, as it's described. It's a link that has no breaking point. They were always connected. Now they are locked together. And <clears throat> there's this sense that he is, um, that this locking together, on the one hand, this is something that he has done. He had of his own will turned to the shadow, right? Obviously, his will is very important in that. Had he not done these steps that he had done, right? Had he not 
resisted it and run the first time. Had he, uh, that is when, when it was attacking him. Um, had he not turned to face it, had he not chose to try to seize it in his own living hands, this wouldn't have happened, right? And yet, by the end of the paragraph, notice that it begins to sound like it. This is not just like he has laid a necessity upon the shadow, right? This is not him having achieved some kind of mastery over the shadow, right? Neither could escape. When, it, when they had come to the time and place for their last meeting, they would meet, right? It's like this external necessity has been placed upon both of them. Um, as a consequence of his choice, again, his choice is still clearly involved. Because of what he did, this bond between them, this, this closeness of bond has been formed, right? Um, but the, it has consequences for the both of them. He has sort of pushed things to the point where there's no longer any escape uh, for either one of them. Um, so, yeah, uh, David Atley's asking, you know, he says, the pointlessness is odd. Does that mean that neither of them can hasten the end, that it's destined? There doesn't seem to be any other hint of such compulsive fate in Earthsea. Well, yeah, I mean, the idea of... Fate of destiny is something that has been kind of peeking at us, I think, a little bit. I, I mean, I remember that coming up a couple times last week when we were looking at uh, uh, chapter seven and eight. Um, when we were looking at, you know, again, the question of who has doomed the deem, who has deemed the doom, right? That was deemed. Uh, there's been this, it's been at least an open question of is, you know, was it the Terranon? Was it the, uh, uh, the shadow or was it something else? Right. Um, is there some other kind of, is there something else in control? Um, the idea of compulsive fate, I'm not sure that's quite right. Um, I mean, I agree with you that the idea of a compulsive fate does seem, contrary to the spirit and, if you will, the flavor of Earthsea. And yet, um, I don't think this is the first indication that something like that does happen. Um, but again, I don't know that I would use the phrase compulsive fate uh, to describe it exactly. And we will see, David, as we get closer in chapter 10, there will be he, Sparrowhawk, will feel some urgency at the end, right? Like it is possible for their meeting not to happen as it's supposed to happen, right? Um, I don't, so I don't think the fate is compulsive in that way, right? Um, it isn't exactly, perhaps, inescapable. Um, but his feeling right now sure sounds very similar to that. When they had come to the time and place of their last meeting, they would meet, right? I mean, that sentence is, of course, almost a simple tautology, right? I mean, that sentence essentially is saying, so when they met, they would meet, right? I mean, that's, that's, kind, of, uh, that's kind of the implication of it. Um, there seems to be more on his part of a, a sort of a releasing of it, right? Um, he is not going to cease moving towards it, but he doesn't have to, he doesn't have to pursue the shadow itself anymore. And I agree, Gerald, it does presume that Ged's understanding is correct. It might not be, right? Um, uh, that is certainly true. Um, yeah, good. Um, Yeah, well, well, let's see, James Stevens. Well, we'll see what we see. Let's keep, actually, hang on a second. Second paragraph there. Um, notice how the realization that he has has two sides to it, right? It's like a kind of like a good news, bad news situation. The good news is he doesn't have to worry. He doesn't have to worry that it's going to chase him down. He doesn't have to worry that it's going to get away from him, right? Um, he doesn't have to hunt it, exactly. 
they are tied together and that link has no breaking point. That's the good news. The bad news is there's not going to be any rest or peace for Ged. This doesn't mean he can just retire, right? Oh, great. I'll just go back to Gaunt and raise goats because I don't need to hunt it, right? It's all good. Everything's fine. Everything's not fine. Um, he can't escape it. The shadow, what will draw? We don't even know. Will it draw him? I don't know. But he has to move towards that last meeting. There, He will not have any peace, day or night, on earth or sea. Um, that's... There is, so there is this necessity placed upon him, right? He knows he has to do it. But he now understands more clearly exactly what it is uh, that he has to do, right? Um, now, I agree with you, Jocelyn, that um, he the realization that he has is sort of the meaning of the quest, Right. Um, yeah, I think I agree with you, Jocelyn, that it's it's not. Well, and I think that the events will show the meeting is not completely inescapable. Again, it's not like he need put forth no more effort. Right. Again, he can just like, kick back and retire and whatever. Like when it's meant to be, it will come about like that. That's not certainly not the attitude that he has here. Um, is it possible for him to turn and retreat and try to get away from it? Maybe. I mean, he doesn't. So we don't really know what would have happened had he tried to do that. Right. Um, but, um, but I do agree that the most important thing is that he, his understanding now, right. Of what his task is. He had thought he had to undo what he did. He had released this evil upon the world, and the first thing he was doing was trying to escape it, right? Uh, to get away from it, to elude it. Um, but he can't elude the consequences of his actions. He cannot escape uh, this hunter, which is bound to him. Uh, and although the game changes when he turns around to face it and to hunt after it, um, he finds that it's still, it, he can no longer, no, not only can he not escape it, he cannot catch it either, right? Um, his job had never been to undo what he had done, but to finish what he had begun. I don't know that I understand what that means exactly. That is, I... I believe that he does. And I think that that difference is a very important difference. Um, it's certainly an important difference. I mean, so the, there are parts of it, of course, that I think I do understand. Um, it's a big shift in his own thinking, right? He's not trying to, he knows he made a bad mistake, right? You know, that he did a really bad and a really foolish thing. Um, so long as he was working towards trying to undo that, like trying to erase a mistake that he made, trying to remove the consequences of a previous action, he was attempting something impossible and futile, right? He has a more sort of, a well, more accurate, a more mature, perhaps, understanding of the situation when he realizes, no, I can't undo what I did. Um... I have to finish what I began. Um, the part that I don't understand. Uh, so basically the idea that meeting the shadow and overcoming the shadow and, you know, eliminating the danger that is the shadow that he's released is not an undoing. It's a completion, right? It's him finishing a task, not him uh, uh, undoing something that I kind of get. Um, what I don't get is the sense in which, I guess it's the, it's the second half of the phrase that I struggle with. The finishing part, I get. What he had begun. The full implications of that, I'm not sure I understand. Um, in what sense will his, uh, in what sense will his overcoming of the shadow I'm trying to be careful with the verbs that I use there because of course um, he certainly is not going to undo what he did in, the, <clears throat> I mean, 
If you're going to undo what you did, if, well, if what you did was summon something, to undo it is to banish something, right? And that does seem to be the way he's thinking at the beginning. He's got to banish the shadow, right? He summoned it. He's got to send, you know, he's got to, he brought something from somewhere else into this world and he's got to send it back where it came from, right? Uh, in order to, uh, uh, in order to overcome it, in order to win, in order to undo what he did. Um, and that certainly doesn't seem to be what he is actually going to do. Um, but, uh, uh, yeah, exactly, Jocelyn. We won't know until four paragraphs before the end, and I don't want to jump ahead to that now. I want—I'm trying to kind of stay in this moment here, right after the third confrontation and before he sets off on the last leg of his journey here. Um, but uh, yeah, I agree with you, Christopher, that we have seen evidence of Ged's shadow being important from the beginning of things, long before even his first reading of the summoning spell. Yes. Yes, I agree. Um, and is there a sense in which, I don't know. Again, I, I'm not sure. This, this is something I, I just kind of think I need to sort of think about or maybe even sort of live with for a while longer. Le Guin often gives me this feeling, by the way. Uh, this is a very familiar experience for me, reading Ursula Le Guin. Um, uh, maybe, maybe someday I will finally be old and wise enough to read Ursula Le Guin and understand. Uh, there are always things, whenever I read Le Guin, I always have that same feeling. I'm like, well, I think I'm not old enough to understand this yet. Uh, maybe someday I will be. Um, but, uh, yeah, and Nancy, I agree. That is uh, one of the things that I find so very admirable about her. There's, you know, it's one thing to say, as I've so often said, that you know, books that I love and and great books. One of the one of the defining elements of them, of course, is that you know you see new things in them and you learn new things every time you read them. Um, but uh, there's kind of. Ursula Le Guin is kind of on a next level with that, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, that is at least uh, literally as far as I'm concerned. Like when I'm the reader, that's that's certainly the experience that I have. Um, but um, anyway, OK. Um, so we'll see. We'll see ways in which we think I want to. I don't want to labor over this phrase too long right now because I hope it will make more sense when we get to the end and we see what happens. Um, but at least kind of asking the question is, I think, uh, important, uh, uh, important there. Um, now, Noam, that's a real, that's really well remembered and thought of. Noam is, uh, reminds me that Ged did the summoning, right? He performed that summoning in order to do something, right? There was something... Uh, that he was trying to do, and that was left unfinished, right? Yeah, I think it's important to think about. Um, yeah, okay, so let's, um, let's keep going. So this is now on into chapter 9. Um, I love this passage. Okay, near the beginning of chapter 9. Uh, this is Ged visiting these rustic uh, villagers. I forget which island he's on. Um, but it's where he gets his boat, look far. Other deeds Ged also did in his days in that village under the steep forests of the Hand as his power came back, came back into him. These were such people as he had known as a boy in the northward vale of Gaunt, though poorer even than those. With them he was at home, as he would never be in the courts of the wealthy, and he knew their bitter wants without having to ask. So he laid charms of heel and ward on children who were lame or sickly, and spells of increase on the villagers' scrawny flocks of goats and sheep. He set the rune simn on the spindles and looms, the boat's oars and tools of bronze and stone they brought him, that these might do their work well, and the rune pir he wrote on the roof trees of the huts, which protects the house and its folk from fire, wind, and madness. When his boat look far was ready and well stocked with water and dried fish, he stayed yet one more day in the village to teach to their young chanter the deed of Morid and the, and the Havnorian lay. 
Very seldom did any archipelagan ship touch at the hands. Songs made a hundred years ago were news to those villagers, and they craved to hear of heroes. Had Ged been free of what was laid on him, he would gladly have stayed there a week or a month to sing them what he knew, that the great songs might be known on a new isle. Okay. Um, what I love about this passage is what we can see in Ged, right? One of the things we've been looking at and kind of tracking throughout the book is Ged's own kind of personal and moral progress, right? Um, and, I, I, you know, I've said it several times, but I just marvel at any author who can just show us and help us to intuitively understand something without having to explain it and draw our attention to it, any author who can do that really well is accomplishing a very remarkable thing in writing, right? But to one of the things that I think is really hard to do that with is people growing up, right? I mean, we have watched Ged from his young days as Dooney growing up, you know, so we've seen him from the ages of what? Something like nine-ish to, 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 to 19. Uh, and we have seen him grow and change a great deal. And I don't know about you, but if I were, um, if I were writing this, I would never have been able to resist the temptation, you know, to draw attention to it, to be like, and so, you know, get as, you know, like just not to say in these words, even I wouldn't be that clumsy, but to say, have the narrator say something which essentially translates to like, Look how Ged has grown up, right? Um, but she is so, uh, she is so subtle. She is so, um, uh, so discreet about that kind of thing. I, to me, this is one of the most moving passages. To do. when when I think back to the Ged that we have seen before, right? Um, whether it be the young Dooney. Uh, studying with his aunt, whether it be the impatient young Prentice uh, traveling with Ogion, uh, whether it be the brash and boastful young uh, and, and envious uh, young student on Roke, whether it be even the chastened and more fearful uh, Ged, uh, you know, who first uh, uh, came to Low Torning, um, this is different and very much more than we have seen before, right? Um, uh, and it's very remarkable. The connection back to the northward veil of Gaunt, the similarity, uh, our, the way that our attention is drawn to the fact that this setting that he finds himself in is one that is very like, even more, um, uh, even poorer, right? Even uh, uh, even more challenged and less glamorous even than his own village back in Gaunt. Remember how Jasper used to taunt him for being a goat herd and how that used to bug him? How Jasper could get under his skin just by, you know, alluding to the fact that he was from a was the, he was a goat herd villager, right? They used to drive Ged crazy, right? And now we see him returning to these people who are lower even than those low people among whom he grew up, right? And rather than distancing, distancing himself, rather than instead he takes his first, his own experience among them. Like they, these are his kind of people, right? Um, and he takes that connection and that empathy that he feels for them, seasoned by all the things that he has learned and the experience that he has gained along the way, uh, to just come and without request or reward, to humbly and generously do for them the things that he knows better than 
Certainly somebody like Jasper ever could have known exactly the things, not only that they most need doing, but that will matter most to them, right? I mean, the, the kinds of blessings that he gives to them. Could he have done something more grand? Is he capable of performing magic that is way far above the, uh, you know, the spells that he performs for their benefits here? Probably is, yes. But he doesn't do that. Why? Because this is what they know and value. This is what they want. This is These are the things that are going to affect them most, right? To bless and heal and protect their sickly children. Uh, to put spells of increase on their livestock, right? To bless their tools, their spindles and looms and oars and uh, tools of bronze and stone so that they might do their work well. He doesn't try to change them. He doesn't revolutionize their lives, right? He doesn't introduce new technologies or uh, new things that they've never imagined. He just takes the poor things that they have, their scrawny flocks of goats and sheep, their tools of bronze and stone, and uh, blesses them, right? So that those things will prosper and work you know, better than the people of this village ever hoped that they would. Um, protecting the, you know, uh, uh, writing runes on the roof trees of their huts. He doesn't build them new huts, right? He doesn't, he doesn't magically conjure up a, a great stone house for them to gather in or something like that, right? He just goes to their crude, presumably crude, huts uh, and lays runes upon them to protect the house and its folk, right? Not only the, I mean, the thoughtfulness and generosity, um, but the humility. This is, you remember when I, were, I was debating before, right, about, uh, you know, is he really humble or is he just fearful? Um, you know, is he just worried that he won't succeed? Is he just, is it, you know, there were all those questions I was asking anyway when we got to low Torning. I have no questions at all anymore, right? This is in several different ways. Very remarkable humility. And then that second paragraph, right? And what does he do? He teaches them songs, right? Uh, he blesses what they have and where they are, but then he, they apparently are very interested in these songs, right? And he has new songs that they can learn. He wishes he could stay an extra week uh, just to, to teach them more songs, just so that he could teach them um, uh, all the songs that he knew. Right. He would stay for a month just for the pleasure of sharing with them songs that they haven't heard before and not for his own sake. Right. I mean, goodness, think how think how Dooney would be feeling and acting. Right. If he were here. Right. He would be lording it over these people. He would be uh, just drinking in their adulation and uh, their awe. He would be building for himself a reputation as the greatest whatever, everything, right, ever to be here. Um, Ged is, seems, from these two paragraphs, absolutely self-forgetful the entire time, right? There's no evidence in here that he thinks even once of himself, his reputation, what they think of him. I mean, notice we're told nothing of that. Presumably, they're all kinds of impressed, right? I have to imagine that when Ged leaves this village... Right. The visit of the strange wizard who came among them and did all of these things is going to become a matter of prodigious local legend. Right. Um, he is establishing the kind of name for himself that he always dreamed of. And yet no reference to that of any kind. Right. Um, he's uh, and instead, what does he think of? He just he. He is motivated that the great songs might be known on a new isle, right? Um, it's the stories themselves. It's these islanders who've never had the opportunity to hear them. Those are the only things that he thinks about. And I, I think this is um, absolutely remarkable. Uh, but again, both as both on Ged's part um, and on Le Guin's part, um, uh, just as I say, very remarkable. And Zach, I agree. Pretty wise for a kid who's like 19. Yes. Yes, absolutely. And we'll get back to that in a minute. Though, Brian, I do agree that Le Guin's writing makes it easy to forget how little time has really passed since Roke and how young Ged still is. Absolutely. It is easy to forget that. Um, though it's kind of funny, Brian, that 
At no point has she given the clear impression that he stayed anywhere for a really long time. So, I mean, it's the kind of thing which, as soon as you think of it, you're like, yeah, you know, he's been traveling around and he's been, you know, there have been like months have been going by here and there, but there's been nowhere that he's been sitting for decades or something like that. So, sure, yeah, he would still be pretty young. And yes, and yet I, I agree. Um, it's easy to forget. It's easy to forget how young he was when he went to Roke in the first place. It's how it's easy to forget how young he still was when he left Roke uh, as a full wizard. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, okay. Oop, whoop, sorry. Okay. He sailed a day and a night over the lonesome sea, and on the second day he came to a small isle, which they told him was called Vemish. The people in the little port looked at him askance, and soon their sorcerer came hurrying. He looked hard at Ged, and then he bowed, and said in a voice that was both pompous and wheedling, Lord Wizard, forgive my temerity, and honor us by accepting of anything you may need for your voyage, food, drink, sailcloth, rope. My daughter is fetching to your boat at this moment a brace of fresh roasted hens. I think it prudent, however, that you continue on your way from here as soon as it meets your convenience to do so. The people are in some dismay, for not long ago, the day before yesterday, a person was seen crossing our humble isle a foot from north to south, and no boat was seen to come with him aboard it, nor no boat was seen to leave with him aboard it, and it did not seem that he cast any shadow. Those who saw this person tell me that he bore some likeness to yourself. Okay. Um, a couple things here, right? One, of course, is that we can see that the third encounter between the two of them, when Ged reached out with his living flesh and attempted to, uh, and touched the shadow and, and tried to hold it, he felt that it formed this unbreakable link between the two of them. It changed their relationship. It changed the nature of the entire situation. And Ged appears to be not the only one uh, who has been changed by that. You'll remember that before the second confrontation, when he was chasing it, right, the one which ended, the confrontation which ended in his shipwreck, as he got tricked into chasing it and wrecking his own ship on the rocks uh, in the fog, um, he saw the shadow coming to him over the water and it was in the shape of a man and it was the narrator speculated um, at the time that perhaps it was taking the shape of a man because Ged had summoned it, right? Um, that is, that there was something about Ged's own activity and his own um, summoning of the spirit, not the first time, but the second time, which was drawing it into, maybe even binding it into the shape, uh, you know, a general anthropomorphic shape. Things have clearly gone substantially past that, right? Uh, the, <clears throat> the, yeah, I was about to say the specter that has loomed over Ged, but that's perhaps an awkward and embarrassing uh, or rather conspicuous way to say that. The prospect which Ged has been most afraid of, right, has been of becoming a Gebeth, of being cons having the shadow enter into him and consume him so that it wears the outer shell of him, but it has consumed all of him from within and has consumed his power and can use his power for the destruction of others. And he did call it his shadow, James. Absolutely. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, Anyway, so what appears to have happened, right, now that he has formed this unbreakable bond between the two of them, now that um, he feels that they are uh, bound together towards their meeting in this, if not inescapable, uh, almost necessary way, we find that the shadow itself has been changed. The shadow now goes around wearing Ged's form. It's like, I can't decide whether this is like a, a sort of a parody of Gebeth Hood or whether this is like an inversion of Gebeth Hood exactly. Um, but James, as you said, he called it his shadow before. Um, and now it is very clearly his shadow. It is walking around in Ged's 
form. It's not a Gebeth. It's like an anti-Gebeth, right? Um, not exactly an anti-Gebeth. Uh, but anyway, it's I, I, I can't really put my finger on sort of the relationship, right, between what this is, right? The shadow in that is walking around in, in Ged's form and the Gebeth shape. Um, uh, it is nearly a doppelganger, yeah. Um, and, Gerald, that's not even really clear. And, Gerald, I apologize. All class long, I promise you, I'm going to continue to be tempted to call you Gerald uh, because your name begins with G-E. Um, uh, by, by the way, one thing that I'm... I, I, I think we'll have to see if I'm right, um, but I think I succeeded for the entire class of fighting against my autocorrect, which continually wanted to change Ged's name into all caps, which I was confused by for a while. I'm like, why is it putting that in all caps? And then I realized, of course, it wanted to turn his name into the GED uh, 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 exam. So there you go. Um, uh <laughs> I, I, it took me a surprisingly long time to figure out why it kept changing the capitalization. Anyway, um, so I don't know, Gerald, whether or not the shadow's transformation into Ged's form is willing or unwilling on its part. Is it aping? Has it been given the power to ape Ged directly now? Or has it been like frozen into Ged's shape since he touched it. Um, I don't know, except I think if I had to guess, not quite sure. Um, I think I would guess that it was unwilling on the shadows part. And the reason for that is I don't think, and now remind me if I'm wrong about this. Um, but I don't remember any time when the this thing, right, the shadow form which looks like Ged and which people mistake for him on the street, um, I don't think that that ever does anything, right? Like it's seen a couple. It's going before him, and it is uh, seen by people, and it is recognized. It's creeping people out, but it's not acting. Right. It's not posing as him, for instance. It could do, you'd think. Right. Um, it's not acting like the shadow did with Skior, for instance. Right. Um, yeah. So I, I uh, um, it seems to be kind of minding its own business. In a sense. Right. Um it doesn't seem to have a plan. Again, it doesn't seem to be taking any action, and we know it can take action. Again, it um, it used Skior and Skior's body to draw him out into the middle of nowhere and attack him, right? Or not just the middle of nowhere, but the middle of nowhere, not too far from the court of the Terranon. Um, so, yeah, anyway... Um, we know that it can plan. We know that it can do things. We know that it can... Uh, uh, you know, not just imitate others, but anyway, but it's not doing that. Um, and so it is, a, it's, it, it, it sounds almost as if the shadow is just going before him, right? Um, in his form, right? I mean, notice he didn't do anything on this island. It just crossed the island from north to south, right? Just walked straight across the island over the ocean, right? Over the island and off the ocean on the other side. Um, uh, it can inhabit, subvert, and kill, or rather, carry. we've seen it do that before, but it can't now. It can't now. Ged knows it can't do that to anybody but him, right? That's how the bond works. Um, yeah. Yeah, Noam, that is interesting. Uh, Noam says, funny, the shadow doesn't have a plan, just as Ged doesn't have one. Yeah. Uh, Ged is following behind it. But he's not hunting it. He's not trailing it. He's not seeking for news of it, right? But it just, it does kind of turn out that wherever he goes, his shadow seems to have been right there before him, right? Um, yeah, yeah. 
exactly. People, it's creeping people out. That's the main thing that's happening here. Um, and um, it's... Uh... Yeah, see, Jocelyn... I could imagine, I think an argument could be made that the shadow isn't really sentient independently at all. Um, I think that that, you could make that argument. But I think I can make an argument against that too. Um, I, you know, the, 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 the data that we have on the shadow there is not very conclusive, really. Um, I think... What we hear in chapter seven and eight, though, suggests pretty strongly the shadow had a plan and executed a plan uh, in bringing him to where it brought him for that first confrontation and its attempt to devour him. Um, and that there was some kind of active collusion between the shadow and the Terranon. So I think it's not just reflecting him. Um, it's not just. Yeah. But say, eh, Noam says the shadow always does what Get expects it to do. Yes, though, again, the causality could go both ways there, right? I mean, Noam, you could just as well say Get always expects the shadow to do what it does. Um, which, which way does the, does the causality arrow point there? Um, and again, the thing that has been said from the beginning is this connection between the two of them. So one way or the other. Um, as I said, I think the argument could be made both ways, but, um, yeah. Um, yeah, David says perhaps the plan is just to look uncanny and get seen so that get isn't really welcome anywhere. Well, that's a success here. I mean, one of the things, uh, you know, several of you are commenting on the wonderful pomposity of the uh, of the sorcerer here uh, and how long he takes to say, please leave and don't stay here. Uh, uh, the faster you can leave, the better. Um, but what really strikes me, I mean, yes, all of that stuff is true. What really strikes me is the fear that almost certainly underlies this speech, right? Um, he is being formal and extra, you know, unnecessarily polite and stiff and kind of Jasper-like. I agree with that. Um, but this dude is also freaked out, right? Uh, he's only a sorcerer and Get outranks him. Get is a, is a visiting wizard, so the local sorcerer should be polite to Get, right? Because Get could probably kick his butt. So, um... Oh, he's, I mean, he has every reason to think so. The sorcerer, I mean. But there's obviously more than just that. As he, in his roundabout and very carefully worded, the people are in some dismay, right? Uh, and he uh, goes on, was seen crossing our humble isle, which makes me think of Mr. Collins in Pride and Prejudice. Um, what he is quietly, with as little offense as possible saying, is he has no idea what Ged really is. Is Ged a Gebeth? Right? Is this... I mean, there is some monstrosity here. Um, so, wheedling means, uh, like, uh, when you're, like, uh, begging. Like, wheedling is what you're... that tone that your teenagers use when they're trying to convince you to say yes to something that they know you're inclined to say no to. Uh, that's what a wheedling tone is. Um, uh, but dad, yeah, exactly. That's kind of the, the less, not necessarily protesting. Um, uh, but yeah, the, it's more, more kind of, uh, begging. Yeah. Um, uh, <laughs> anyway, um, What he's described is completely freaky, right? I mean, they have reason to be freaked out. Something just came on foot to their island, right? That is, and they, they, and, and like they, and, 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 and it looked like a wizard. It was in the shape of a wizard. Does he carry a staff? 
The shadow? I don't know if the shadow is carrying the sha- a shadowy staff or something. I don't know. But anyway, it, at the very least, it was a dude, right? So there's this dude. This guy, apparently a guy, has just come walking across the water, crossed over the island without stopping or talking to anybody, and left the other side of the island and went walking off across the ocean, right? That's freaky. Then, when is it? The next day? Day before yesterday. So two days later... An identical guy comes by boat with a wizard staff, right? So he's a wizard. Okay, so that guy, so the wizard in some other form had walked on and now is showing up in the boat. Like, what does this guy want? Who is this guy? What is he doing? What kind of powers does he have? Uh, what does he want from them? What is he doing? Why would he do that? Um, it's, um, uh, yeah, no, yeah, walking on water is totally freaky. Everyone's always freaked out by walking on water. Um, yeah, and I mean, that, that was true in the New Testament, by the way. What did the disciples do when they saw Jesus walking over the water? They freaked out. They thought it was freaky. It's always been freaky. Um, there's never, I don't think there's a single example of people walking on water that isn't freaky. Um, but, um, yeah, anyway, um, Yeah. Um, but the combination of the two, right? Yes, Karina, they did think that Jesus was a ghost. That's, that's, that was their reading, right? They were like, this is freaky. He must, be a, he must be a spirit. It must be a ghost. Yeah, exactly. Um, no, that is exactly what happened, Karina. Uh, anyway, so, but th- that would be bad enough. That would be bad enough. That would be unsettling, right? There would doubtless be some dismay among the people at, like, the dude who randomly came walking to the island and left again on foot. Um, but for the same guy to appear now coming, what, like, coming in power, coming, you know, in a boat with a staff, and they're like, oh, the creepy walking on water spirit thing is back, and now it's got a wizard staff and is, like, coming in asking for our help, like seeking harborage, like wanting us to take it in to our community. Thank you. No. Can we, but do you say no? Right. What do you go to the wizard guy who apparently can like walk on water as well and be like, actually, yeah, get out. We don't want your, your kind here. Like, no, you got to tread really carefully in this situation. So I kind of feel for this sorcerer. Uh, who is um, uh, really trying, I think, pretty desperately to strike the least. So his answer, like, how do I tell this certainly dangerous because a wizard and, I, I, you know, completely off-putting and, fr- and creepy guy um, who I don't even, we don't even know if he's human, right? Um, <laughs> how do I, how do I banish him you know how do i that's that's what the people certainly are expecting like okay sorcerer protect us from whatever that is right and he's like um okay um and uh so his answer is lots of words right i'm gonna i'm gonna uh be super polite uh and uh but try to encourage him to leave and in a way i think it's a kind of test I think it prudent, however, that you continue on your way from here as soon as it meets your convenience to do so. He's not said to get lost. He's not certainly not said anything offensive. Um, uh, the people are in some dismay. Notice how he segues to... He doesn't suggest that there's, like... Um, he doesn't suggest any cause and effect. He does not say, the people are terrified of you, please go. Right? He doesn't say... Uh, you know, he just says it might be convenient for you to leave, please. Uh, um, I think it prudent for you to continue on your way as if it's for his benefit. And then he's like, in related news, the people are all creeped out about this other thing, which may or may not maybe have something to do with you. Maybe you would know best about that. Please don't hurt me. Right. I mean, it's this is an awkward speech. As I say, I feel for the guy. Um, he's using his business manner. <laughs> yeah. This is even more than his business manner. Um so I think in a tight spot, this uh, sorcerer is doing pretty well. But this is where we learn about this. This is where we learn about the shadow. And it is just going before him. Um, James, one of the Jameses, I'm forgetting which James, uh, said before, 
uh, a while back when we were um, talking about that first, his realization that although he says there's no need for hunter or hunted anymore, neither of them, they're, they, you know, they're, they're both neither hunter nor hunted, um, that nevertheless he is going to hunt him, right? And in a sense that's true, in the sense that he goes after him, right? Um, Ged never ceases to be the pursuer in a literal, like, geographical sense, right? The shadow's in front of him and he's coming along behind. Um, but what he's not doing is tracking it. What he's not doing is seeking it. He's not seeking the shadow, but he is finding out that wherever he goes, it was there first, right? Um, it's thinking back to that realization passage, it seems to me more like they're both going to the same place and the shadow has a bit of a head start, right? Um, or he is not hunting, not tracking, not stalking the shadow, um, but following after it to the place where it is going, right? That it is now seeking a destiny. It's not seeking him, nor is it running from him. Exactly. Right. It was it was trying to trick him. It was trying to elude him before. Um, it's not doing that anymore. But it's going. Uh, somewhere else. Right. Um, and he's coming after it. And it, based on what we've heard, I have to imagine. That it's going towards the meeting place and he's following after but again he's again he's not tracking it he's not asking after it you know he's not seeking for tidings of it and following in its path he's just going and finding that it is it has gone before him and along a very similar path um okay he's then uh, gets to ifish and he hears he's in the streets and kind of resting there, but it's a little, you know, uh, he's there's that uh, so, so many more passages I wish that I could have talked about, but I knew I had to be a little bit disciplined and not just talk about it the whole thing, paragraph by paragraph. But um, the sense of isolation that Le Guin gives to us, right, the way in which he is in this apparently friendly island um, and which we know if our memories are attentive is the island that Vetch said was his home homeland, right? His home island. Um, and so it has from back in his Roke days associations with welcome and friendliness. And yet his sense of isolation is pretty profound, right? Remember, that's the description that we get of him wandering around the streets and looking at people in conversations from a distance, right? Looking through windows and seeing domestic scenes that he is shut out from, right? There's this sense of him having been separated from all of mankind, um, which seems to correlate with his binding to the shadow and which seems to be prefigured by his polite dismissal from Vemish, right? Uh, Whatever you are and whatever issue you have, we don't really want you here. We are not comfortable with you being here. Um, please, please leave and please don't hurt us. Right. Um, he doesn't get that here on Ifish, but he does. He's still outside. Right. Literally outside in the street half the time until he overhears a man and a girl. And he recognizes a voice. He followed and caught up with the pair, coming up beside them in the late twilight, lit only by distant lantern gleams. The girl stepped back, but the man stared at him and then flung up the staff he carried, holding it between them as a barrier to ward off the threat or act of evil. And that was somewhat more than Ged could bear. His voice shook a little as he said, I thought you would know me, Vetch. Even then, Vetch hesitated for a moment. I do know you, he said and lowered the staff, and took Ged's hand and hugged him round the sh shoulders. I do know you. Welcome, my friend, welcome. What a sorry greeting I gave you, as if you were a ghost coming up from behind. And I have waited for you to come, and looked for you. I 
I love this moment. I love this turning point, right? Um, what seems for a moment like it is going to be the final death knell of his connection with humanity, right? He was fleeing from everybody, right? He was fleeing from low Torning and the place that he had made for himself there um, because he knew the shadow was coming after him and he didn't want it to be near anybody, right? So he's just like running around on his own, uh, hoping that if the shadow catches up with him, it won't catch up with him anywhere there's anybody that he likes, right? Um, then he turns towards the shadow, right? Leaves Ogion and goes hunting. And that too is a solitary pursuit, right? Him and the shadow. Now he's finding that he's been separated. Again, that it seems that that bond between him and the shadow, there's now like a boundary line between him and all of the rest of the humanity, uh, the, the rest of humanity as he, you know, there's, remember the shadow is from the unliving lands, right? There is something alien, alien to life, alien to love, alien to human contact right about the shadow from the very beginning. And as he and the shadow have been drawn closer together through their confrontations and bound closer together, he has, it seems, been drawn further and further from uh, society. You'll remember I was suggesting that in the um, the couple, the uh, I almost said refugee couple, that's not quite right, the castaway couple, Right. Um, the old man and the old woman on the island where he shipwrecks or the sandbar on which he shipwrecks um, seemed to me like a, a little a potential glimpse of his future. Right. Cut off from all memory of contact with other people. Right. That seemed to be potentially almost the fate that seemed to uh, lie in wait for him. And again, notice his response to that, his response when he finds himself back among people as he's recovering from that third. Uh, when, that's when we got that wonderful passage about him blessing and giving to the villagers. Right. Um, and. So we see him making deliberate choices not to distance himself from people, not to pull away from people completely. And yet now people are pulling away from him. And so here, his closest friend in the world, his only friend in the world, I mean, Ogion is his friend, but that's different, right? He's his master. That's not the same. Um, the only peer he's ever had, the only friend he's ever made. Uh, and as soon as he sees him, Vetch holds up his staff as a barrier to ward off the threat or act of evil, right? And that staff, which is the thing they had in common, right? It's the thing that bound them together, their studies together at Roke uh, in wizardry. And that staff itself is held up as this barrier between the two of them. It's a, I, I find this a very powerful moment uh, showing for a moment, right? This, like this, it's like the, the humanity, uh, is slamming the final door in his face. His last hope of human connection would have been with Vetch, right? And here's Vetch himself slamming that door just for a moment, right? And he feels it, it seems. His voice shook a little as he said, I thought you would know me, Vetch. And Vetch still hesitates for a moment, but then he lowers his staff. And takes his hand and embraces him, right? And he is welcomed in. He's brought into his home, Vetch's home, Vetch's family home, right, with his brother and his sister. And uh, I want to choose my verbs carefully again. Ged sees happiness like he's never imagined before. Contentment. Um, like he's never experienced himself. This is the kind of environment that he never had as a child, right? The kind of thing that as a child, it seems he didn't even know he was missing, right? It was hinted to us that he was missing it. Um, just when we re read about the death of his mother and the way in which he was brought up by his aunt or the extent to which or the limits of his upbringing by his aunt, right? Um, but... Um, but anyway, um, this is, again, the choice that Vetch makes here not to shut him out. And remember, he has almost this as much reason 
exactly the same provocation, right, as the people of Vemish. It's not for no reason that Vetch does this. He also had just seen Ged's shadow. And of course, there are two differences between him and the people of Vemish, right, uh, in being creeped out by the shadow and then seeing Ged himself. Uh, on the one hand, he knows more than they do, right, about Ged and about magic. And so he has some reason to be less totally, like, freaked out about it than they did. But at the same time, he also knows more than they do. Some, to some extent, his knowing more than they do is a bad thing, right? Um, because he knows what that thing was. They don't know, right? Maybe that just leaves them to imagine the worst, but he knows what it is. And he's got to think, um, he's got to think that this is a very bad sign. The shadow now looks like him, right? What does that mean? Um, I have to imagine that Vetch has been living in fear for the last day that Ged has become a Gebeth, that what he saw was the Gebeth form of Ged. Um, what he just saw was the shell of his old friend now hunting around and seeking whom he may devour, right? Um, and so now when in the dark the shape of Ged comes up behind him in the street, him and his little sister, right, um, he is understandably on edge, right? And his action, uh, his staff barrier is in no way inappropriate as a reaction to that, right? Um yeah, exactly, Nancy. More knowledge isn't reassuring when your fears are rational. No, no, it's really not. But Vetch makes the really important choice here. All right, I better speed up or I'm going to take forever here. Okay. Um, some of the conversation that they're having. Uh, Vetch is saying that he wants to come with. This is right after Vetch has said that he wants to come with him. No, Estario, this is no task or bane of yours. I began this evil course alone. I will finish it alone. I do not want any other to suffer from it. You least of all, you who tried to keep my hand from the evil act in the very beginning, Estario. No, I don't think that's right. You who tried to keep my hand from evil from the evil act in the very beginning, Estario... Pride was ever your mind's master, his friend said, smiling, as if they talked of a matter of small concern to either. Now think, it is your quest, assuredly, but if the quest fails, should there not be another there who might bear warning to the archipelago? For the shadow would be a fearful power then. And if you defeat the thing, should there not be another there who will tell of it in the archipelago, that the deed may be known and sung? I know I can be of no use to you, yet I think I should go with you. So entreated, Ged could not deny his friend, but he said, I should not have stayed this day here. I knew it, but I stayed. Wizards do not meet by chance, lad, said Vetch. And after all, as you said yourself, I was with you at the beginning of your journey. It is right that I should follow you to its end. He put new wood on the fire, and they sat gazing into the flames a while. Um... Yeah, Melanie, I agree. Vetch is really an awesome friend. Um, pride was ever your mind's master, he says, which, of course, we know to be true and has never been stated explicitly until this moment. Um, notice what he is very gently saying. By separating himself the way that he has, he thinks he's sparing other people and everything, but he's doing himself no favors, right? Um how can Ged be sure that his re his resolution to go alone no matter what is not best, is not right? Vetch points out that in doing so, he is, in a small way, recapitulating the mistake that he made back on Roque Knoll, right? He was motivated by pride before. And he's, and, you know, very gently, directly, uh, candidly, but gently, Vetch says, don't make the same mistake again, right? Don't let that happen again. Um, 
And he points out, of course, that this desire to separate himself is not actually for other people's benefit. Right. Um, If he wins, other people should know about it. The, the deed might be known and sung. Not to puff Ged up, right? But, like, remember one of the problems that Ged and the Archmage and everybody else was running into back on Roke after the attack of the Shadow initially? Nobody knew anything about this, right? What was that thing? How do you defeat it? How does this work? What can anybody do? Remember, he was trying and trying to find any precedent for anybody who had faced anything like this before to see if there was anything that could be done. And, of course, the Archmage himself didn't know anything about it, told him that it had no name, which turns out to be untrue. Well, sort of true, but not true, right? Um, for everyone's benefit, certainly for the benefits of future wizards and stuff, it should be known. The deed should be known. Um, and... Should the shadow win, people should be warned, right? Only good to others can come from Vetch's accompaniment, Vetch argues, right? Um, don't be by yourself. Don't just think of yourself. I think that when I ceased to flee from it and turned against it, that turning of my will upon it gave it shape and form, even though the same act prevented it from taking my strength from me. All my acts have their echo in it. It is my creature. In Oskil it named you, and so stopped any wizardry you might have used against it. Why did it not do so again there in the hands? I do not know. Perhaps it is only from my weakness that it draws the strength to speak. Almost with my own tongue it speaks. For how did it know my name? How did it know my name? I have racked my brains on that over all the seas since I left Gaunt, and I cannot see the answer. Maybe it cannot speak at all in its own form or formlessness, but only with borrowed tongue as a gebeth. I do not know. Notice how Ged is both near and far from the final solution, the final realization, right? All my acts have their echo in it, it is my creature. Right now, that's a really important word, I believe. Right? It is my creature. I. It sounds like Ged means that, like Le Guin means that word in its most literal sense. It is my creature. I created it. Right? And that's, of course, what creature means, a thing that is created. Um, it is my creature. I made it. Right. No, I created it, which is different from making it right. To make something means to take pre-existing raw materials and assemble them in some way. Right. To create something means to call something into being right. That did not have being before. Um, his sense of the intimacy of their connection that his turning his will upon it gave it shape and form. This seems to fit with what we've seen. He's coming to understand more and more clearly the depth of the connection between the shadow and him. And not, I think, just that. His realization here, I think, is not just that as they've gotten closer, as this bond has formed between them, this link between them, that um, they, that the shadow has taken on more and more of him, Right. It's not just that. It is my creature, he says. But yet he still cannot understand how it could possibly have known his name. Having affairs he must see to before he left Ifish, Vetch went off to, the other, to other villages of the island with a lad who served him as prentice sorcerer. Ged stayed with Yarrow and her brother, called Moor, who was between her and Vetch in, in age. He seemed not much more than a boy, for there was no gift or scourge of mage power in him, and he had never been anywhere but Ifish, Tok, and Help, Holp, sorry, and his life was easy and untroubled. Ged watched him with wonder and some envy, and exactly so he watched Ged. To each it seemed very queer that the other so different, yet was his own age, nineteen years. Ged marveled how one who had lived nineteen years could be so carefree. 
Admiring Moore's comely, cheerful face, he felt himself to be all lank and harsh, never guessing that Moore envied him even the scars that scored his face, and thought them the track of a dragon's claws and the very rune and sign of a hero. I love the way that Vetch's brother um, serves as a kind of mirror to Ged here, right? We get this one little glimpse, and again, oh, Le Guin is so... I know I keep drawing attention to it, and like the way I'm drawing attention to it is like the opposite of her subtlety, um, but that's okay. That's my job. Her job is to tell the story. My job is to make things obvious. Um, but this is such a... Uh, uh, her touch here is so gentle, right? Look what she has done for us in... Look at the light that she is casting on Ged's life to this point, right? Here in Vetch's brother, Ged is seeing, like, the alternate universe version of himself, right? Here's what his life could have looked like had he not had the gift or scourge of mage power, right? This is what he could have had if he had grown up in a loving family, Right, rather than in the circumstances that Ged grew up in, right? Um, yes, Gerald Ged serves as a mirror to 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 Moore as well, and we don't get Moore's perspective; we get only hints of it. Right? How uh, Moore is in awe of Ged, right? The very rune and sign of a hero. Oh my goodness, uh, that is such a wonderful phrase. Um, yeah. Nancy says, I wonder if it means anything that Moore has a use name referring to a bird like Ged's, whereas Yarrow and Vetch are both uh, are called for other things. Um, yeah. Um, are both called for flowers, right. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, again, it's certainly I was thinking that with the, the, the connection to, to Ged as well. Um, As he's pursuing his, sh I mean, the, the way, and, and again, like the multiple mirroring, right? We already have the shadow as Ged's mirror, right? Right? You know, this sort of horrible negative of Ged in, in some sense, like photographic negative almost, not quite photographic negative, that's too clumsy, but anyway, this certainly this dark reflection of Ged, and here's mirror this bright, comely, cheerful uh, reflection of Ged, right? Um, yeah, anyway. Uh, I see. Hang on a second. Good. Brian. Yeah. Brian was saying, I uh, hates to pass by the single paragraph when Jasper's failure to win his staff is mentioned. Um, uh, yeah, I, that's all we get of Jasper's story, right? That he does go off to the court of you know, remember that that the beautiful lady who was there, whom Jasper was impressing at the feast that time, uh, when Ged was super envious uh, of Jasper. That moment, which was like the pinnacle of Jasper's glory on Roke, um, he goes and becomes court sorcerer uh, for them, but he never earns his staff. He never becomes a wizard, right? Yeah, he goes off to O. Um, that's all we know, right? Um, In, I mean, this is one of those things. One of the effects of this, it seems to me, is it makes the rivalry in retrospect seem so absurd, as, you know, childhood rivalries so often do in retrospect, right? It just, it seems so absolutely essential at the time, but in retrospect seems so silly, right? Um, Jasper was never really his rival, right? Um, but of course in the end it was never even then really about Jasper and to me that's one of the conclusions that I can't help but come to right in hearing about what came of Jasper Jasper doesn't turn out to be like you know the guy who is someday going to be like the runner up for Archmage or something you know like no that's not going to happen um, he is not in fact Ged's opposite number he was never a mirror of Ged Right. Um, Ged's competition was always with himself. Right. His issue was always himself. Um, 
and he didn't see that he didn't understand that um and so she Le Guin let us fail to understand that right along with yeah at the time right and come to the realization of how that what that really was afterwards just as and at the same time uh and, and in the same way that Ged comes to understand it so good okay uh, so Yero is asking Ged to explain some stuff about magic. And uh, she was just asking why, when they're on the high sea, they don't just say meat pie and conjure up meat pies. And he was explaining how they can make illusion, but they can't do this, that wizards are not cooks. Nor are cooks wizards, alas, said Yero on her knees to see if the last batch of cakes baking on the hearth bricks was getting brown. But I still don't understand, Sparrowhawk. I have seen my brother, and even his prentice, make light in a dark place only by saying one word, and the light shines. It is bright, not a word, but a light you can see your way by. This is an excellent question, right? If illusion is not real, how do you make an illusion of light that really lights the room, right? Then it's real, right? It's not just illusion. I get answered. Light is a power, a great power, by which we exist, but which exists beyond our needs in itself. Sunlight and starlight are time, and time is light. In the sunlight, in the days and years, life is. In a dark place, life may call upon the light, naming it. But usually, when you see a wizard name or call upon something, some object to appear, that is not the same. He calls upon no power greater than himself, and what appears is an illusion only. To summon a thing that is not there at all, to call it by speaking its true name, that is a great mastery, not lightly used, not for mere hunger's sake. Yarrow, your little dragon has stolen a cake. Um, okay. This is another paragraph I'm not going to pretend to understand all of, because I don't. In particular, I do not understand the relationship between light and time. Maybe someday I will understand it, but I don't understand it yet. But in the meantime, there are a couple things that do seem tolerably clear. Light is a power, a great power by which we exist, but which exists beyond our needs in itself. Okay, so let's start at the end instead of the beginning. When a wizard calls an illusion, some object to appear, he's not calling on something outside himself. He is... Making it, when he makes an illusion, right? When a wizard makes an illusion, they are calling upon their own power. That comes from, they are the source of the power which makes the illusion, right? When they summon something that is outside themselves, like a meat pie, right? Which can provide uh, sustenance to the wizard, something which is not himself. You can summon a thing that is not there at all uh, by speaking its true name, but that is a great mastery. So to invoke, uh, to have power, to have mastery over something that is outside you, right? Um, that is a big deal. So illusion, not a big deal. The power comes from you and is nothing but you and your own imagination and what you are conjuring. You are bringing to yourself something which is beyond you when you speak its true name <clears throat> and you achieve this great mastery. Light is different. Light exists beyond our needs in itself, right? So in one way, it is like the meat pie, right? It is a thing that is not us, but it is not a thing that is not there at all. Um... In a dark place, life may call upon the light, naming it. Light is a great power by which we exist, but which exists beyond our needs in itself. Um, light is a great power by which we exist, he says. So there seems to be a connection between the light and there are, so a wizard makes illusion by his own native power, but that native power itself, he says, is derived from light, right? So when a wizard speaks into the darkness and calls light to appear, 
it's not the same as conjuring a meat pie, achieving mastery of something that is outside you, because light is not outside us in the same way. Just as <clears throat> uh, in a dark place, life may call upon the light, it says, because there is this connection between light and life. Um, Yeah, Stephen says that the sunlight and starlight are time makes him think of Genesis 1 with the lights in the firmament and dividing the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. Yes, makes me think of that a little bit too. Uh, and David Erbach uh, is made to think of relativity. Um, sunlight and starlight are time. Yeah. Which also I don't think I fully understand. Relativity. I mean, I kind of understand it. I mean, like, mathematically, I kind of get it. I know how to deploy it. I'm not sure I understand it on a metaphysical level. Um, but um, anyway. Uh, okay. So the wizard power is the light. Sort of. Or at least light is the source of the wizard's power. Light and life are the source of the wizard's power. And the wizard's power, light, casts a shadow, Noam says. Yes. Yeah, Noam, it is kind of conspicuous, isn't it? If we think about light being the source of the power of the of the of the wizard right so in this sense conceptually behind the wizard is light and in front of it is the shadow that ged casts now the thing that i dislike about that is that it makes it sound like that's inevitable right like every wizard must cast a shadow um but this is weird right i mean almost unprecedented and not you know almost perfectly unprecedented, only one president that he could find. So I don't think that we can, you know, that conception seems to me flawed in that way. Um, but, uh, yeah. Um, the, where I get that light is a source, Carrie, is that uh, third sentence. Light is a power, a great power by which we exist. Uh, and then he says, uh, um, in a dark place, life may call upon light, naming it. Um, uh, yeah, uh, by which we exist. That's the source concept, really. Um, but, um, yeah. Um, And yes, good, Bruce. Here, power is a lowercase p. This is not like the old powers, capital O, capital P. Yeah, no. Um, no. Yeah, and so, Carrie, you're right. I don't want to be, I don't want to make it sound too simplistic. Um, like it's just a really simple cause and effect, like life and light are a simple, or light and life are a simple cause and effect, respectively. Um it's more like a relationship. I don't know. Life may call upon the light, naming it, right? Um, and it does seem to be... The other place where I'm getting that connection, Carrie, is the way in which... The distinction that he's making between light and meat pie. When you call upon meat pie, you are calling upon something outside you completely. Uh, you are achieving mastery over a separate thing. When you are summoning light, when you're calling upon the light... It's not the same. It's not um, summoning a thing that is not there at all. Um, if you are there, it is there. Um, yeah. Well, Noam, like so Noam says, I would argue that every action does have its shadow, which is why great work should not be taken lightly. Yes. Um, with the equilibrium and understanding the consequences of your actions, right? Which is, of course, exactly what Ged was rebuked about, um, that for his ignorance, right? Not knowing what the shadow of that action would be, right? 
Let's keep going because we've got more uh, metaphysics here. This is still Yarrow asking questions. Tell me just this, if it is not a secret. What other great powers are there besides the light? It is no secret. All power is one in source and end, I think. Years and distances, stars and candles, water and wind and wizardry, the craft in a man's hand and the wisdom of a tr in a tree's root, they all arise together. My name and yours and the true name of the sun or a spring of water or an unborn child, all are syllables of the great word that is very slowly spoken by the shining of the stars. There is no other power, no other name. Staying his knife on the carved wood, Muir asked, What of death? The girl listened, her shining black head bent down. For a word to be spoken, Ged answered slowly, there must be silence, before and after. Then all at once he got up, saying, I have no right to speak of these things. The word that was mine to say, I said wrong. It is better that I keep still. I will not speak again. Maybe there is no true power but the dark. And he left the fireside in the warm kitchen, taking up his cloak and going out alone into, into the drizzling cold rain of winter in the streets. He is under a curse, Muir said, gazing somewhat fearfully after him. I think this voyage he is on leads him to his death, the girl said, and he fears that, yet he goes on. All power is one in source and end, I think. All things arise together, my name and yours and the true name of the sun. All are syllables of the great word that is very slowly spoken by the shining of the stars. So all power is light. Um, and Melanie, I agree. It is a beautiful image. That sentence, uh, the one which ends with all are syllables of the great word that is very slowly spoken by the shining of the stars. Um, it is beautiful. What is the answer to the question? What of death? So in other words, she says, what other great powers are there besides the light? And his answer is none, none. Light is the only power. Light, everything is a great word slowly spoken by the shining of the stars. Everything that is, is that. So what about death? What is death? Muir asks. For a word to be spoken, there must be silence before and after. So death is the silence in which the word is spoken. If all of the world, if all power, if all light and life is the word spoken by the stars, death is the silence into which the word is spoken. Okay. Exactly, Melanie. We're right back to poetry. Yeah, absolutely. Um, death is the silence in which the word is spoken, death is the darkness into which the light shines. Yeah. But the most important thing here is not the metaphysics. The most important thing here is where Ged ends up. <clears throat> He's speaking very confidently, right? And very wisely, it seems. But then he says, I have no right to speak of these things. The word that was mine to say, I said wrong. He is a marred syllable in the great word. Right? That's his sort of condemnation of himself. It is better that I keep still. Maybe there is no true power but the dark. And then both of them interpret this another way. Notice his actions. He leaves the fireside in the warm kitchen, taking up his cloak and going out alone into the drizzling cold rain of winter in the streets. Right. 
from warmth, from the warm hearth and the communion with uh, these people who are like, you know, the siblings and the family he never had out into the drizzling cold rain of winter in the streets alone in the dark. Um, and we get these two different ways of seeing it. He is under a curse. Yeah, kind of is. It's true. Or you could say his voyage, le voyage leads him to his death and he fears that, yet he goes on, which is also true. Um, yeah, good. Um, yeah, Brian Dimmick says he will remain mostly quiet for the rest of the book. Yeah. Um, he does say very, very little. Do we get how much direct dialogue do we get from him between now and his final confrontation with the shadow? Not much. Vetch came home the next day and took his leave of the notables of Ismay, who were most unwilling to let him go off to sea in midwinter on a mortal quest, not even his own. But though they might reproach him, there was nothing at all they could do to stop him. Growing weary of old men who nagged him, he said, I am yours by parentage and custom and by duty undertaken towards you. I am your wizard. But it is time you recalled that though I am a servant, I am not your servant. When I am free to come back, I will come back. Till then, farewell. Um, I just one I wanted to read this passage together, just thinking of kind of closing the loop on some of the early conversations and speculations that we had. Remember when we were trying to figure out what a wizard was and a sorcerer was and how wizards and sorcerers and mages were talked about um, uh, back in the early, you know, first couple chapters uh, when it seemed to be more of a profession that you took up, right? And by now in the book, we have a clearer understanding of this, right? How it's kind of like a public service, like the sorcerer of that uh, village, right, who is responsible for it and who is put in the position to deliver that very uncomfortable message to Ged. Um, but, um, uh, but it's also not just... And there are people who go around making money by being traveling wizards, um, kind of like peddlers or tinkers, right? Um, but uh, except, you know, a little bit higher profile. Um, but I love Vetch's sentence, though I am a servant, I am not your servant. Um, I am your wizard and I am a servant, but I am not your servant. He doesn't work for them. They don't have authority over him. He doesn't have authority over them either, but he's not hired help. Um, the relationship is definitely more, uh, complicated than that. Um, Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, Brian, I agree. There is some element of a profession like I am your wizard, though there he's not just saying I'm your wizard in the same way as somebody saying, hi, I'm your plumber. Right. It's not it's it's not the same. He is their wizard by parentage and custom and by duty undertaken towards you. All of those things. Right. He's like, I am yours. I'm not abandoning you and I'm not gonna abandon you. Um, this is his place and he is going to serve them voluntarily for the rest of his life. But I'm not your servant and you don't command me uh, and uh, I'm leaving. Anyway, I just wanted to kind of close the loop on that because I thought it was an interesting little insight, that passage. On their final trip, Ged doesn't want to use magic. Not even to do apparently simple things like turning salt water into fresh water or using the mage wind in the sails. But Ged seemed most unwilling to use his craft or to let Vetch use his. He said only, it's better not. And his friend did not ask or argue. For as the wind first filled their sail, both had felt a heavy foreboding, cold as that winter wind. Haven, harbor, peace, safety, all that was behind. They had turned away. They went now a way in which all events were perilous and no acts were meaningless. 
on the course on which they were embarked, the saying of the least spell might change chance and move the balance of power and of doom, for they went now toward the very center of that balance, toward the place where light and darkness meet. Those who travel thus say no word carelessly. I have no idea what to say about this. This is an, uh, one of those passages that's obviously important, but I, I, and I'm not sure that I understand it exactly. Um, the journey toward the very center of balance, the place where light and darkness meet. The one sense that we are given very clearly by this the journey that they are on from the beginning, when Vetch and as soon as Vetch and Ged leave Ifish and set off, um, they. This is not just a physical journey. They are on simultaneous. They are on a physical journey, and they do have to make arrangements for their physical journey, like bringing water and food. Um, but they. This is not just a. This is as much a spiritual journey as it is a physical journey. And in more than metaphor, it is not just, it's not just a way of talking about it, right? Like as they journey off, they are also taking a spiritual journey. Like, no, it's literally a spiritual journey. And that becomes more the way in which the physical and the spiritual are overlapping becomes more and more explicit as they get closer to the end, right? To the point where the wind, the physical wind is still blowing. Vetch can feel the earth wind, right? The physical wind blowing, but it's not blowing the sail, right? Because where they are and where they are traveling to is a spiritual realm, not just a physical realm. Um, but it's also not just a spiritual realm. They haven't like passed through the doors of Hades or something like that and are now in the underworld. It's not quite like that either. They're not. Um, this is they are in the physical world and in the spiritual world. Um, when Ged goes out and walks on the water. He's walking on sand, right? But yet he's also walking on the water. Um, the overlap of the physical and the spiritual world um, has begun. And so that I, seems to me what this paragraph is sort of pointing us towards. Um, they have to be... It's less about steering their ship than it is about being concerned about changing chance and moving the balance of power and doom. I wish I could have seen all the cities of the archipelago, Ged said as he held the sail rope, watching the wide gray wastes before them. Havnor at the world's heart, and Ea where the myths were born, and Shaleth of the fountains on way, all the cities and the great lands, and the small lands, the strange lands of the outer reaches, them too, to sail right down the Dragon's Run away in the west, or to sail north into the ice flows near to Hoganland. Some say that it, that is a land greater than all the archipelago, and others say it is mere reefs and rocks with ice between. No one knows. I should like to see the whales in the northern seas, but I cannot. I must go where I am bound to go, and turn my back on the bright shores. I was in too much haste, and now have no time left." I traded all the sunlight and the cities and the distant lands for a handful of power, for a shadow, for the dark. So, as the mageborn will, Ged made his fear and regret into a song, a brief lament, half sung, that was not for himself alone. And his friend replying spoke the hero's words from the deed of Aerith Akbi. Oh, may I see the earth's bright hearth once more, the white towers of Havnor. I was in too much haste, and now have no time left. I traded all the sunlight and the cities and the distant lands for a handful of power, for a shadow, for the dark. Ged did what he did in ignorance, and it was for his ignorance that he was scolded. 
And now he knows. Now he sees. Now he has learned. Not about the spell and what the spell would do. Now he learns the consequences of his choice. Now he understands the choice that he made without knowing it. His desire to prove himself, his desire to earn glory, his desire to satiate that desire for dominance that he had uh, in his early years. Um, in order to satisfy that, he now sees that he's traded the wide world that he's just ex that he's just described, right? So much to see, so much he could be, so much he could do and experience. And he traded all of that for a handful of power, for a shadow, for the dark, the dark towards which he has turned and into which he is going. Remember several other things. <clears throat> Remember the spiritual journey. Remember dark versus light. Where is the power, right? As he was just talking about. Remember his trip into the land of death seeking after Petchfury's son. Remember his own state where he pushed himself into a comatose state where his spirit was wandering, right? Called back by Ogion twice, right? Once by Nemerle, twice by Ogion. Once by the Otak, right? Um, this is something he's chosen again and again, right? What happened on Roke Knoll, Christopher, thinking of what you were saying about the shadow coming before him and filling his life prior to that, this has always been the choice he's made, right? This is the choice he's been making since he was a child. And only now does he see it. Only now does he understand it. And so when he goes this last time, when he's embarking on this spiritual journey, um, this physical and spiritual journey simultaneously and overlaid, he is now going understanding the consequences to finish what he had begun he's got to go there and come back right um yeah at that Ged left off his bleak thoughts and his gazing ahead over the sea and he saluted Yarrow more earnestly that is you know Vetch had just like you know proposed a toast to his sister Yarrow who provided their food more earnestly perhaps than Vetch the thought of her brought to his mind the sense of her wise and childish sweetness. She was not like any person he had ever known. What young girl had he ever known at all? But he never thought of that. She is like a little fish, a minnow, that swims in a clear creek, he said. Defenseless, yet you cannot catch her. At this, Vetch looked straight at him, smiling. You are a mage born, he said. Her true name is Kest. In the old speech, Kest is minnow, as Gedwell knew, and this pleased him to the heart. But after a while, he said in a low voice, You should not have told me her name, maybe. But Vetch, who had not done so lightly, said, Her name is safe with you as mine is, and besides, you knew it without my telling you. This is, of course, a lovely moment between him and Vetch, um, and, uh, uh, and even of course, between him and Yarrow, in a sense. And, of course, another wonderful example of Vetch's nature and what Vetch does and what Vetch means for Sparrowhawk. But, of course, I want to highlight it in particular as the puzzle that has been before him, the kind of compound puzzle. Seems like two puzzles, but maybe it's the same puzzle, is... How did the shadow know his name? And how can he learn the name of the shadow? Right? The dragon knows it and could tell him? Maybe. The Terranon knows it and could tell him? Maybe. Um, here we get this sweet, charming, homely, friendly, heartwarming finding of a name. Right. He perceives her true nature. She is like a little fish, a minnow, that swims in a clear creek, defenseless that you cannot catch her. You know, defenseless yet unassailable, right? Defenseless yet perfectly safe. 
Um, that's how you find a name, right? By seeing what a thing is. Just like Ogion was trying to teach him way back when, right? When he was trying to learn what are the uses of the forefoil, right? And, uh, uh, and Ogion said, you know, you've got to get to know the Fourfoil in all of its ways and all of its seasons, right? Um, presumably, the same thing needs to happen with the, uh, um, the same thing needs to happen with the shadow. They've come to the last island, right? Yet they who live there may know of farther lands, get answered. Why do you say so? Vetch asked, for Get had spoken uneasily, and his answer to this again was halting and strange. Not there, he said, gazing at Astuel ahead and past it or through it. Not there, not on the sea, not on the sea, but on dry land. What land? Before the springs of the open sea, beyond the sources, beyond the gates of daylight. Then he fell silent, and when he spoke again it was in an ordinary voice, as if he had been freed from a spell or a vision, and had no clear memory of it. Think back to that realization. What does it mean to not be hunter or hunted? He just knows. He knows, where, he knows that where they're supposed to be is that way. He knows it's land. Right? So he's like, it's like, I don't know, it's like deductive reasoning, right? I know we're supposed to go that way. I know that I'm supposed to have the meeting on land. And I know it's not this land. Therefore, I conclude that there must be land past this, right? That's, that's just QED, right? But he's not speaking logically. He's perceiving, right? Gazing at Astuel and past it or through it, Right? Um, I am tempted to say to get in this passage like Bigwig you'd better ask Fiverr um, or you'd better go tell Fiverr that's who he sounds like here to me um, he has a picture of something that Vetch cannot perceive again spiritual journey as well as physical journey and of course they're not gonna um, uh there's like, oh, Jocelyn, if you really like Watership Down, you should. T we did that. We did a, a, a class, on, a Mythgard Academy class on that. You should totally go watch that one. It is awesome. It was such a fun class. Oh, my goodness. One of my favorite books of all time. Um, anyway, sorry. Um, yeah, so where they're going is both spiritual and physical. They are going out, be but it seems important that it's beyond the last land, right? Crossing a boundary is requisite, right? Only by crossing a boundary in the physical world and going out into the outer seas where everything is different, where magic doesn't even work the same way, um, you know, going out further than anyone has ever gone who has returned, only by traveling out that way in the physical world can they also travel to the right place in, um, can they travel to the right place in the, in the spiritual world. Makes sense. The companions slept that night in the smoky warmth of the lodge. This is in that last island again. Or still. Before daylight, Ged roused his friend, whispering, Estario, wake. We cannot stay. We must go. Why so soon? Fetch asked, full of sleep. Not soon. Late. I have followed too slow. It has found the way to escape me, and so doom me. It must not escape me, for I must follow it however far it goes. If I lose it, I am lost. Where do we follow it? Eastward. Come. I filled the water skins. Again, I filled the water skins, right? It's not, um, uh, it's not just a spiritual journey, right? Um, but um, so, yeah, David, I'm not 100% sure I understand the way of escape for the shadow either. This is where we're coming back to the stuff we were discussing at the very beginning with that realization. Their meeting isn't inevitable. He realizes now their meeting is not inevitable. He does need to hurry. Um, he can miss it. 
if he does not come, he has to go. So there's a sense in which their meeting is inevitable. That is, the sh- he's being drawn towards it, and the shadow can't avoid it so long as he shows up. But if he doesn't show up, or doesn't show up in time, um, then he couldn't miss it. So I think the point is, again, it's not... That's what, This is why I was resistant to the idea of compulsive fate earlier on. It's not compulsive in that way. He's not being born whether he wills or no to this meeting. The realization that he has here seems to be that um, his will has to be involved. He has to choose. And it's from here that he begins using the mage wind. Right. He now is uttering a spell when he was reluctant to use any magic before because he didn't want to throw off the balance. Right. He didn't want to uh, change some chance. Right. Now he does want to change the chance. Now he is. I mean, let me go backwards for a second just to make sure I find the frame, the phrasing there might change chance and move the balance of power and of doom. Something he does could do that. Something he does could move the balance of power and of doom. Something that they do could change chance. That's possible. So he's trying not to mess it up because he thinks that if he doesn't mess it up, it'll happen. Does he believe? He seems to have believed earlier on that it was inevitable, that it was inescapable, that they would just both be brought to the meeting somehow. He has this insight here at the beginning of their journey from Ifish that there is something that can could happen to throw things off and mess it up. And he doesn't want to do that. And now he realizes further, I think, that um, it's that was true. But it's not that he has to be careful not to do anything to mess it up, but rather he has to do something to make it happen if he doesn't change the chance. It won't happen. And the shadow will escape him. Right? He cannot be passive heading towards this or else the shadow will escape him. He has to seek it. He has to follow. Fast. If I lose it, I am lost. Because he knows which way to go. In that sense, he's not hunter. He's still not hunting it. He's not tracking it. He knows where it's going. Right? And he's got to get there in time or else it'll be too late. All that day, all that night, they were driven by the powerful wind of majory over the great swells of ocean eastward. Ged kept watch from dusk till dawn, for in darkness the force that drew or drove him grew stronger yet. Always he watched ahead, though his eyes in the moonless night could see no more than the painted eyes aside the boat's blind prow. By daybreak, his dark face was gray with weariness, and he was so cramped with cold that he could hardly stretch out to rest. He said, whispering, hold the mage wind from the west, Estariel, and then he slept. Um, the boat was renamed Lookfar by the very grateful villager whose cataracts he cured, uh, and whom who characterized the cure of his cataracts very conspicuously in retrospect as being given the gift of light. He didn't realize there was so much light still in the world until Ged had given that light to him by curing his cataracts. And so he says, we should call this boat Look Far and you should paint eyes on either side of the prow uh, that will look out as my eyes now look out, right? And of course, the eyes are blind. The prow of the boat is in fact blind, right? It's just painted eyes on the boat's blind prow. Yes, physically, right? In a sense. But uh, I love this parallel of Ged looking out into the darkness, right? He can't see in the darkness not in the physical world, right? And yet the force that drew or drove him grows stronger yet throughout in the darkness, right? 
and he's watching ahead and he's not seeing anything, but yet he kind of is seeing something, right? He is looking far, looking far beyond the physical world now, right? Um, yeah. Good. James remembers that when Ged meets Vetch, Vetch says, it's time to come out of the dark. Yeah. And now, of course, Ged is going into the dark. Um, like he went into the dark after Petchvery's son. Right again, I'm, we can see the parallels of that journey. Like he went not knowing what he was doing, right? When he uh, cast his first spell, first major spell, uh, and overshot his own power. Michelle was wondering, should we make anything of the way he consistently calls Vetch by his true name through this part? Um, yeah, I think so. Um, this is all about this journey. The spiritual journey is all about seeing things for what they are, right? Naming things for what they are. Um, this that's like that's the journey that he's on right um yeah Yeah, let's keep going running out of time for so close again that night ged watched for he could not sleep in the dark nor would he sleep when the third day came still they ran with that ceaseless light terrible swiftness with that ceaseless light terrible swiftness over the sea, and Vetch wondered at Ged's power that could hold so strong a mage wind hour after hour here on the open sea where Vetch felt his own power all weakened and astray. And they went on until it seemed to Vetch that what Ged had spoken would come true, and they were going beyond the sources of the sea and eastward beyond the gates of daylight. Ged strayed forward in the boat, stayed, stayed forward in the boat, looking ahead as always, but he was not watching the ocean now, or not the ocean that Vetch saw, a waste of heaving water to the rim of the sky. In Ged's eyes there was a dark vision that overlapped and veiled the grey sea and the grey sky, and the darkness grew and the veil thickened. None of this was visible to Vetch, except when he looked at his friend's face. Then he too saw the darkness for a moment. They went on and on, and it was as if, though one wind drove them in one boat, Vetch went east over the world sea, <clears throat> while Ged went alone into a realm where there was no east or west, no rising or setting of the sun or of the stars. Notice that at the same time that the two worlds are sort of coming together, they're also separating, right? Um, Vetch and Ged are like, they're coming to their destination, but the two of them are having increasingly different journeys. Um, by the way, I am very interested in her choice, in Le Guin's choice, to narrate most of Chapter 10 <clears throat> from Vetch's point of view, primarily, right? The further Ged travels away from... So now, notice something. Notice what he's doing. He's traveling away from the light into the darkness, away from humanity and off into the solitude uh, where there is no community. It's further and further, even from his friend who's with him in the boat, right off to where there's no rising or setting of the sun or of the stars. Parallel to him leaving society behind before and going off on his own. But then he was doing it wrong. Right now he's doing it right. This is the so he had what he was doing before was like a shadow of what he was supposed to be doing, right? Um, it was similar. It was parallel, but it wasn't quite right. Good. Gerald said there were stars that never set in the land of death. Yes, um, and it seems like that's where he's getting again. There is no rising or setting of the sun or of the stars. Is he beyond the stars? It's beyond the land of death. It's like the land of death, but it's not the same as the land of death. The climb and purge of the boat grew less and 
plunge, not purge, yikes. The climb and plunge of the boat grew less and less, till at last she seemed to go forward under Ged's strong oar strokes, over water that lay almost still, as in a landlocked bay. And though Vetch could not see what Ged saw, when between his strokes he looked ever and again over his shoulder at what lay before the boat's way, though Vetch could not see the dark slopes beneath unmoving stars, yet he began to see with his wizard's eye a darkness that welled up in the hollows of the waves all round the boat. He saw the billows grow low and sluggish as they were choked with sand. If this were an enchantment of illusion, it was powerful beyond belief to make the open sea seem land. Trying to collect his wits and courage, Vetch spoke the revelation spell, watching between each slow-syllabled word for change or tremor of illusion in this strange drying and shallowing of the abyss of ocean. But there was none. Perhaps the spell, though it should affect only his own vision and not the magic at work about them, had no power here. Or perhaps there was no illusion, and they had come to the world's end. By the way, uh, Sharon, you had mentioned before um, uh, about how parts of this final journey were making you think of uh, the end of the voyage of the Dawn Treader. I totally agree. Uh, this passage most powerfully makes me think of that. Um, I'm not going to talk about that right now because it's like a whole other topic, but I will just say that would be an awesome moot paper. Holy cow. Comparing and contrasting especially the last few chapters of the Voyage of the Dawn Treader and the last few chapters of A Wizard of Earthsea, these journeys off into the west to the end of the world, um, or off into the east, rather, to the end of the world. Um, the relationship of light. Oh, there's so much, right? So much. Um, uh, life and death and light and darkness and the end of the world. and um, Absolutely. Absolutely. Um And yeah, I agree, Brian. One of the consequences of telling the story from Vetch's perspective is that we aren't told much of what's actually happening to Ged spiritually at the end. Slightly frustratingly, there are some of our questions that we're not going to get real answers to in this book. And that's one of the ways in which she is going to accomplish not answering some of our questions about what really happens with the shadow at the end. Um... But even Vetch himself, although he can't see many of the things that Ged can see, even he is now becoming a, like they are arriving somewhere, right? Which is not just the middle of the open ocean. And even Ged or sorry, even uh, uh, Vetch perceives that. Right. Um, and he thinks this must be illusion, but it's not illusion. Um Yeah. Yes, Noam. What started at the center of the world on Roke Knoll, right, ends at the edge of the world. Very good. Very good. Um, yeah. Yeah, David Erbach, I'm, 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 I'm going to be agreeing with you in a few minutes there. Um, yeah, let's just keep going. At first it was shapeless, but as it drew nearer, it took on the look of a man. An old man, it seemed, gray and grim, coming towards Ged. But even as Ged saw his father, the smith, in that figure, he saw that it was not an old man, but a young one. It was Jasper. Jasper's insolent, handsome young face, and silver-clasped gray cloak, and stiff stride. Hateful was the look he fixed on Ged across the dark intervening air. Ged did not stop, but slowed his pace, and as he went forward, he raised his staff up a little higher. It brightened, and in its look, in its light, the look of Jasper fell from the figure that approached, and it became Petchvery. But Petchvery's face was all bloated and pallid like the face of a drowned man, and he reached out his hand strangely, as if beckoning. Still Ged did not stop, but went forward, though there were only a few yards left between them now. Then the thing that faced him changed utterly, spreading out to either side as if it opened enormous thin wings. <gasps> it has wings exactly like the Balrog! And it writhed and swelled and shrank again. Ged saw in it for an instant Skior's white face, and then a cloud, a pair of clouded, staring eyes, and then suddenly a fearful face he did not know, man or monster, 
with writhing lips and eyes that were like pits going back into black emptiness. Nancy says it retains a memory of everything that contributed to it. Yeah. These are all things that are part of Ged, part of Ged's story. Um, the first two seem sort of simple enough, right? His father and then Jasper. Two figures tied very closely to all of the bad thoughts and feelings and motivations that Ged had in his youth, right? Um, Petchvery, though. Drowned Petchvery. Petchvery was his friend. He failed Petchvery, and Petchvery didn't understand why he failed. Right? He failed to save Petchvery's son. And it does seem connected with that. Here's the best I got. The three things, when I try to combine these three things and try to understand from those three visions, less what the shadow is than what the shadow is doing, right? Because in that way, I feel like I can make some sense of those three. The first thing it shows to get is his father. Thus, eliciting in Ged, or attempting to elicit in Ged, all of the feelings, the bad feelings from his childhood, right? His sense of abandonment, uh, his neglect, uh, his desire to prove himself and to make a name for himself. Um, then Jasper, and Jasper exactly David Urbach, as you say, appearing the way he was when Ged most hated him. Right, Ged looking like he did right before that final confrontation on Roke Knoll, right? Um, eliciting again, it would seem designed to elicit lots more negative feelings from Ged, right? The same negative feelings that led to the original spell on Roke Knoll, and then drowned Petchvery. The negative feelings associated with Petchvery would be his sense of guilt. Right, his sense of responsibility. This was Petchvery's only child that was dying and died, and which uh, Ged failed to heal, failed to recover. So the negative feelings he would have about would be about his own inadequacy, his own unworthiness, his own inability, his own self-doubt, right? And disgust self-disgust, is he suggesting he, the shadow? Is Petchvery dead? Or is the shadow suggesting that Petchvery might be dead? That somewhere Petchvery that he abandoned? You know, I'm not necessarily saying that the shadow is implying that Petchvery drowned himself in grief and despair, though it's possible that the shadow is suggesting that. Is the view of Petchvery's corpse designed to merely, like, embody, like, this is how deeply you failed him, right? Um, that's the best I got in trying to understand what the shadow is doing in appearing in all these ways. And then the next appearance is the Balrog wings, right? Um, changing utterly, spreading out to either, either side, writhing sw and swelling, right? Um, like it is the whole world, like it is so much bigger than him and can engulf him, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Well, Brian, I'm not sure if the shadow is showing him the reactions those people would have to him or if they're showing, if it's trying to elicit reactions in Ged to them. <clears throat> Maybe both. Maybe both. Um... And then, of course, Skior's white face. And then some fearful face he did not know. Man or monster with writhing lips and eyes that were like pits going back into black emptiness. Right? It's like something that is not 
human at all. Something which is not connected to the light. Like he said living things are, right? But which is unlife, which is darkness inside. Good, Bruce, and kind of like the winged creatures that chased Ged from the court of the Terranon. Yeah, yeah. At that, Ged lifted up the staff high, and the radiance of it brightened intolerably, burning with so white and great a light that it compelled and harrowed even that ancient darkness. In that light, all form of man sloughed off the thing that came towards Ged. It drew together and shrank and blackened, crawling on four short taloned legs upon, upon the sand. But still it came forward, lifting up to him a blind, unformed snout without lips or ears or eyes. As they came right together, it became utterly black in the white mage radiance that burned about it, and it heaved itself upright. In silence, man and shadow met face to face and stopped. Now it is just shadow. Formless, or mostly formless. It's got no form of man anymore. <coughs> it's got legs, but uh, and an unformed snout, but it doesn't have lips or ears or eyes. As the light of his staff becomes brighter and brighter, the shadow becomes darker and darker, right? Um... The light from Ged's staff is bright enough to harrow even that ancient darkness. But the light doesn't just destroy the darkness. The shadow itself has, I was about to say has form, which is odd because the thing that is said here is that it loses form and is unformed. Uh, so that's perhaps the wrong word to use. Um, it has being, is what I mean. Man and shadow met face to face. But by shining the light, all that connection with him <clears throat> appears to be gone. Those memories from his past. Aloud and clearly, breaking that old silence. Because Ged has traveled to the land of silence and he is about to speak the word into the silence the word which he misspoke before. And in that old silence, that ancient darkness, he has already shown a light into that ancient darkness. <clears throat> and he now speaks a word into that old silence. Ged spoke the shadow's name. And in the same moment, the shadow spoke without lips or tongue, saying the same word, Ged. And the two voices were one voice. Ged reached out his hands, dropping his staff, and took hold of his shadow, of the black self that reached out to him. <coughs> Light and darkness met and joined and were one. At the same time that the light of Ged's staff seems to separate Ged most from the shadow, or the shadow most from him, to distinguish them, I mean. Um, light and darkness. Man and almost shapeless thing, right? White and black. In that moment, Ged knows its name, right? And knows that its name is his name which is also the solution to the other, other riddle, how did it know his name? Because it's its own name. Um, okay, all right. So Stephen's got a theory here. He says, So the shadow seemed to be <clears throat> a bad, scary thing. But it's only bad because it's not balanced. So Ged takes it in rather than destroying it, which is a good thing. So is light itself bad if not balanced by shadow? Well, Stephen, this is one of the things that I struggle to understand. Um, yeah. Melanie says, I can still recall how blown away young Melanie was the first time I read this passage. 
Me too. Um, remember how I said earlier tonight that I feel like I'm still not old enough for parts of this book? And someday I'm hoping maybe I'll be old and wise enough to understand it. Well, let me tell you how far I was from being old and wise enough to understand this book when I was like 12, which I think is about when I first read it. I had to have been more than 10 because I remember where I was. Uh, I remember where I was. In the public library in Amherst, New Hampshire. The Amherst Public Library was my library when I was growing up. And, well, from middle school on when I moved to New Hampshire. And uh, um, I remember, I remember the part of the room I was sitting in when I <laughs> read this book for the first time. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, um, I was blown away too, Melanie. But I was mostly blown way out of the water. I mean, if I had to sum up my feelings upon coming to the end of this book when I was like 12, it would have been, uh, huh? <laughs> like, I didn't get it at all. I was like, so wait, what happened? I just, I was so far from wise enough to understand this. Um, Yeah. Um, oh, so many questions you guys have that I don't know the answer to. Ged takes hold of the shadow of the black self that reached out to him. Hang on. <coughs> Sorry. As you can probably hear, my head cold is like uh, reaching out uh, its dark and clinging arms around my head here. But I'm going to try to power through because we're so close. Okay. Let's see. So... Stephen, I'm going to go back and start with you. The shadow seems to be a bad, scary thing, but it's only bad because it's not balanced. So Ged takes it in rather than destroying it, which is a good thing. So is light itself bad if not balanced by shadow? I don't know. Seems a theory. Um, let's see. Um... Uh, Tomas says, if a negative and positive of the same being should cancel each other, or it's not like matter and antimatter, this is the balance, right? They're coming to the center of the balance here. This is it, apparently. On the outskirts of the world, on the very edge of the world, is the center of the balance. And balance is what gets achieved here. And of course, when we think about that, What's the shadow been wanting to do? It's been reaching out to him all the time from when it first clawed his face to when it was trying to eat his face, right? And make him into a gebeth. The devouring of his spirit by the shadow and the shadows, the shadows, like the gebeth, <clears throat> it now seems clearly in retrospect, is like the hideous and imbalanced version of what was supposed to be. The shadow is supposed to enter into Ged. But not that way, because that's an imbalanced way. The darkness merely consuming the light. This is the light and the shadow coming together. Okay. Um, sorry, you guys keep saying things, and I'm uh, <clears throat> I'm uh, uh, falling behind as best I can do. Let's see. Jocelyn says, Ged's light clarifies the shadow. Ged chooses light. He had wondered before if there was only dark in the world, but he accepts the duality. He chooses light, yes, by making the light with his staff. He brings the light, and the shadow brings the darkness. And he acknowledges that that shadow is 
him. And he names it with his own name as it names him. Life without death becomes cancer, says Christopher. It's an interesting metaphor. Um, perhaps. Uh, so Gerald says, did the shadow take or embody part of Ged when it was first summoned? We'll see. This is the tricky thing, is that I've never thought that the summoning of the shadow on Roke Knoll was the beginning of the story. Maybe when Ged realizes that his job, that thing I didn't understand before, that he needs not to undo what he's done, but to finish what he began, that he now understands that this task that he began, he began much longer. This is not just the task he began on Roke Knoll. This is the task that was begun long, long before. This is like him, his life, right? I mean, there's been shadows all over the place. Uh, in his life. Okay. Um, okay, let's see. David Erbach says, when you're fully immersed in light, you don't have a shadow if the light is all around you. Yes. I mean, I agree that there's, like, what we are seeing here... We already know that the, they're operating in a place which is not just the physical world, right? So what we're seeing is something more than the physical interaction of light and shadow. And it, the suggestion is that the mere physical interaction of light and shadow, when light comes in and banishes the shadow, is not the whole story, apparently, right? Because that's not what happens. He doesn't just have to come to the shadow and bring the light and choose the light, and thus is the shadow disintegrated. I'm not 100% sure, but I have a theory that that's what 12-year-old me wanted. What I wanted was him to hold out his staff and bring the light and the shadow to, like, vanish away, to sort of blink out. I think that's what I wanted. It's not what I got. Let's see, so Melanie is responding way back when to Stephen, I think. Yes, when Stephen was said, uh, so, um, Light in itself is bad if not balanced by shadow. Um, Jocelyn was saying, <clears throat> it's not that, but only in darkness the light, is what she says in response, Stephen. It's not that it's bad without. Light is bad without shadow. It can only be, and perhaps it can only be what it really is with the shadow. Yeah. Christopher says, I wanted, he says, you, says to me, you wanted the triumph of obvious good over obvious evil. Le Guin does not play in that world here. No, you're absolutely right. That is just what I wanted. That is just what I wanted and just what I didn't get. Absolutely. Yep. Yep. And I didn't get it. James Stevens says, light can only exist in the world like the word spoken by the star. It can only exist in the void like the word spoken by the stars. Yes. Um, yes. Well, let's go on. I'm acting like this is the last slide, but it isn't because it's a little bit more. Ged lifted his face and gazed at that remote bright crescent in the west. This is after Vetch has fetched him back into the ship. He gazed for a long time, and then he stood up erect, holding his staff in his two hands as a warrior holds a long sword. He looked about him at the sky, the sea, the brown swelling sail above him, his friend's face. Estariel, he said. Look, it is done. It is over. He laughed. The wound is healed, 
he said. I am whole. I am free. Then he bent over and hid his face in his arms, weeping like a boy. Oh, man. Man. The wound is healed. I am whole. Remember, right after this, we're told that Vetch was like, oh, good, I was afraid I was going to have to knock holes in the boat and drown the both of us because I thought you might be a Gebeth. He doesn't know. He won. Even Vetch can't tell, right, what happened at the end there. Because them embracing each other and only Sparrowhawk remaining, you know, that can really go either way. Uh, it was a little inconclusive. <laughs> James Leback says, I guess it's comforting that Vetch is also confused. Yeah, yeah. But David, in the end, you're right. It's a very intimate and personal victory. Notice, though, I'm still not sure I can answer the question. I mean, if somebody just asked me the simple question, so what happens at the end of A Wizard of Earthsea? I'm not sure how to answer that question. Notice that this is not just a question of, like, Ged has to reconcile himself to the darkness within him. It's not just that. That seems to me inadequate, right? It's not like, I am me, and the shadow is me, and together we're a better me, right? What I need is more shadow in my life, right? So I'm going to take it into myself, and then I'm better, right? I, that feels oversimplified. The wound is healed, he says. I am whole. So the wound was the sundering of him in the shadow? Um, the imbalance? Yeah, Michelle says, the answer is, well, it's complicated. Yeah, that's, that's my best answer. Um, perhaps the lack of wholeness is what he's referring to as a wound. Not 100% sure what he's referring to as the wound. Of course, we. <clears throat> he has been scarred, and his scars on his face are one of his most dominant features ever since the summoning of the shadow. Um, so the wounding seems at first to refer back to that. That wound from which he was so long recovering on Roke. <clears throat> right? The wound is healed. I am whole. I am free. Free of the shadow. No more shadow. Right? I defeated it. I got rid of it. It's not going to bother me anymore. Yes. But it's not just that. This is not just... Good has not just overcome evil in that way that I did definitely want when I was 12. Um, Devora, exactly. But a scar isn't a wound. No, no, it's not. No, it's not. Carrie says, Sundering or the summoning of the spirit who had no being which then sought to take being. Yes. You know, Michelle, I wonder that too. Michelle says there's almost a vague sense uh, in all that all of this started before Ged was born. Almost as if his whole purpose from birth was to right some ancient wrong or heal some ancient wound. You know, I wonder... Michelle, I mean, in the end, I don't think it's just about him. I mean, again, we get that sense in that he, he again, he's tied to shadows from before he does the summoning. Right. On the one hand, you know, his speaking his word amiss, as he says to Yarrow. Is the is the you know, the thing that happened on Rokno, Right. On the one hand, the screw up, his screw up. But, you know, Michelle, the more you think about that, the less adequate that feels. It's not just that. 
And that, again, I think is what he's coming to understand. It's not just to undo that thing. I messed up that day on Roque Knoll. I need to make that right. That was his first conclusion. And he's like, no, I need to finish what I started. Started on Roque Knoll? No. Started earlier, I think. But Michelle, yeah, started by him even. Maybe. Jocelyn says he's talking about the wound in the balance or the world or in his destiny. Um, yeah, very possibly. That seems right. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what the relationship between him and the shadow is. And I think that's the thing that I most prominently do not understand. <laughs> or rather, for which my understanding is least perfect there. Um, yeah. Um, Christopher says, so get his mage born. We have no sense that his father has any gift. What of his mother then? Could her death have resulted in fragment, uh, fragmenting of Ged's soul, which is the story of the first part of his life? Uh, yeah, again, thinking back to Michelle's argument that, or suggestion that there is some sense that there is a deeper wound, right? Uh, and if it goes back to then, uh, maybe before then, right? This event happened at the edge of the world, at the heart of the balance, right? The center of the balance. There's something kind of cosmic about this whole thing, too, right? Um, yeah. Until that moment, Vetch had watched him with an anxious dread, for he was not sure what had happened there in the dark land. He did not know if this was get in the boat with him, and his hand had been for hours ready to the anchor to stave in the, the boat's planking and sink her there in mid-sea, rather than carry back to the harbors of Earthsea the evil thing he feared might have taken Ged's look and form. Now when he saw his friend and heard him speak, his doubt vanished, and he began to see the truth. Oh, good, let's hear the truth. That Ged had neither lost nor won, but, naming the shadow of his death with his own name, had made himself whole. A man who knowing his whole true self, cannot be used or p possessed by any power other than himself, and whose life, therefore, is lived for life's sake and never in the service of ruin or pain or hatred or the dark. In the creation of Ea, which is the oldest song, it is said, Only in silence the word, only in dark the light, only in dying life, bright the hawk's flight on the empty sky. That song Vetch sang aloud now as he held the boat westward, going before the cold wind of the winter night that blew at their backs from the vastness of the open sea. Whew, fortunately, we already talked about that poem. If that had not been at the beginning and we hadn't spent three quarters of our first session together talking about that poem, just think what a pickle we'd be in now. But anyway, um... Yes. Noam says, uniting things that were torn apart is a major theme in Earthsea. Seems to be, yeah, um, based on what we can see here. But but Vetch's understanding is rather different. That is, <clears throat> based on Ged's words, the wound is healed. I am whole. Right after, like, he and the shadow hugged it out, right? And now he's like, I'm whole. And I realize that shadow is me and I'm the shadow and we're good now. What seems to have been more of a reconciliation than a confrontation, right? Uh, I mean, from the outside, anyway. That's what it looked like. Um... Yeah, no, I'm exactly. We get something else here. That the truth. We're told it's the truth. Maybe Vetch is wrong, but let's go with Vetch here. It's called the shadow of his own death. 
naming the shadow of his death with his own name, he had made himself whole. A man who, knowing his whole true self, cannot be used or possessed by any power other than himself, and whose life is therefore lived for life's sake and never in the service of ruin or pain or hatred or the dark. <clears throat> okay. That suggests to me that what happened here is not him taking the shadow into himself, not him kind of claiming and owning the shadow and being like, the shadow also is me. And the two of us from now on, we're going to, we're, we're, we're a team, right? And I embrace the shadow. Vetch just suggests that's not what happened. If I am right in associating the shadow with ruin, pain, hatred, and the dark, right? Um, which Ged is not embracing, but rejecting. Ged's life will be lived for life's sake and never in service of ruin, pain, hatred, or the dark. That would be bad. That would be bad. Ruin, pain, hatred, or the dark. That is to, and we've seen glimpses of that in Gebeth Skior, in the court of the Terranon, right? In both of those places, we have seen clear glimpses of what it would be to live in the service of ruin, pain, hatred, and or the dark, right? He is whole in the sense that he has now achieved a kind of mastery over his whole self. He is no longer fleeing nor pursuing the shadow of his death. He now knows his whole true self. By naming the spirit, the shadow of death with his own name, he had made himself whole. So that suggests that what happened there with the naming was not recognition. He didn't look at the shadow and was like, hey, Ged. He was naming it. Like, he was giving it his own name. Ged became its name when he made it so, when he gave it that name. Okay. So the shadow is Ged's own death, yes. And that here I can't. Yes, only in dying life, yes. <clears throat> exactly. Um, so who understood this best? Yarrow. Remember? Uh, way back. Yes. I think this voyage he is on leads him to his death, the girl said. And he fears that, yet he goes on. He mastered his fear of death. He mastered his own death. He <clears throat> only in dying life. Jocelyn. And if we go back... <laughs> go back to the poem which Vetch sings only in silence the word we've just been reminded of that right all of life and all of the world is the word this long slow word that is being uttered by the light of the stars in the darkness and silence right we've had plenty of light and darkness imagery plenty of that where we finally come to in the end is only in dying life. Only in naming the shadow of death by his own name. And remember, that the shadow could, should be associated with his own death is arguably something we should have been thinking more about earlier on as it was summoning the spirits of the dead that opened the gateway for the shadow to come in in the first place. Right. Think of that moment 
of him standing next to the stone wall, the, the stone wall boundary of the land of death, and the shadow staring, looking back on the other side. Right. Um, yeah. Um, <clears throat> oh wait, Stephen. What was that? yeah? Only in acceptance, the rejection, or only amidst rejection, the acceptance. I'm not really sure how 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 that would work. <clears throat> I don't know. Are all the contrasts rejections? The word rejects the silence. The light rejects the darkness. Life rejects dying. I don't know. I don't know. Um, I don't know. But this sounds more like that. From there, the voyage to Ifish was not long. They came into Ismay Harbor on a still, dark evening before snow. They tied up the boat to look far that had borne them to the coasts of Death's Kingdom and back, and went up through the narrow streets to the wizard's house. The hearts, Their hearts were very light as they entered into the firelight and warmth under that roof, and Yarrow ran to meet them, crying with joy. What an awesome ending! Love this ending! Um... Well, Jocelyn, I, this is one of the things I just, I think I still don't get. And I said, this is very like what I said on day one. Um, I hear you when you say it's not rejection, it's duality. I get that, and I see that, but at the same time, I also see rejection. Um, I was ready to accept it as mere, like, embracing of duality and balance. Like, darkness must be present to balance light, and so get in the shadow, we're going to hug it out. I was ready for that. But then Vetch's truth suggests something quite different to me. There seems a rejection of death, a clear rejection of death, and an embracing of life, and never to serve death and pain and all those other things. So, in the end, that's why I don't really know where I am at the end. Um... David says, I only wish Ogion were there. Yeah, me too. Oh, here at the end? Yes. Yes, I agree. That would be the, 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 the last uh, understanding. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, one more. If Astariel of Ifish kept his promise and made a song of that first great deed of Ged's, it has been lost. There is a tale told in the East Reach of a boat that ran aground, days out from any shore, over the abyss of ocean. In Ifish, they say, it was Astario who sailed that boat. But in Tok, they say it was two fishermen, blown by a storm far out on the open sea. And in Holp, the tale is of a Holpish, Holpish fisherman, and tells that he could not move his boat from the unseen sands it grounded on, and so wanders there yet. So the Song of the Shadow there... So of the Song of the Shadow, there remain only a few scraps of legend, carried like driftwood from isle to isle over the long years. But in the deed of Ged, nothing is told of that voyage, nor of Ged's meeting with the Shadow, before ever he sailed the dragon's run unscathed, or brought back the Ring of Arathakbi from the tombs of Atawan to Havnor, or came at last to Roke once more as Archmage of all the islands of the world. Spoiler alert. Um, okay. Two things here. One, we're, this deed is like remembered but not remembered, right? This is not, this is the precursor to all of the deed of the deeds of Ged, right? <clears throat> but um, it, um, <coughs> sorry, but it is the pre is the like necessary precursor to all of them, right? But two things: one, 
What survives of the legend? Apparently, Estario of Ifish must have kept his promise, <clears throat> because in that area, some legends still remain, which seem to recall this incident, right? But the interesting thing is that the element that's retained, right, of all of the different threads of this story, of all the different elements of that final journey that, you know, local myth could have seized upon, the one element is running aground in the open sea far, far to the east. And that fact is deprived of all of its significance, right? It's a funny example where, like, the myth is ridiculously more simple, like, is much more mundane than the fact, right? I mean, it's like he journeyed in the body to the land of death, Except all they remember is, uh, you know, and from that we get the story of a hulpish fisherman who runs aground. Um, actually, him and so wanders there yet is kind of a mythic ending. Um, the two Tokish fishermen blown out to store a storm far on the open sea. Like, seriously, that's all that remains. It's it's just it's a very interesting choice. The overlapping of the physical and the spiritual without any understanding of what it was is all that remains. It becomes a legend of the end of the world, except with no <laughs> mythic significance of any kind, right? Um, yeah. Second point and last point. Um, is James, I have exactly your same question. James Lieback was just asking, where did this text come from then? Don't know. At the very beginning, I thought we were being told the deed of Ged. I thought this was the deed of Ged. Or at least like the opening canto of the deed of Ged or something, right? But it turns out not only is it not the deed of Ged, not, not only is this story not from the Deed of Ged, it's not from anywhere. We have just been told a story that nobody remembers. So having begun and ended with a framework that talks about Ged's significance within the mythic framework of the history of Earthsea, and naming the texts and songs that recall the history of those days, we are then told that this story that we've read is not part of any of that and exists on this, like, completely different plane from the rest of it. And, uh, and that's a really interesting move. It is not unusual, of course, for a story to be told without giving any clear sense of its own framework, narrative framework, right? Like a first-person story, which the first-person narrator would never possibly have been able to tell and record. That kind of thing can happen, and it's fine. Like, often, you know, we can just kind of accept that, right? Accept that somehow this story is giving us, like, a window into these events that nobody else really had, <clears throat> and... Like, it's fine. Like, it's part of the storytelling frame at times, right? Often stories will give us their own provenance, and that will be worked into the fictional frame. And many of us are biased in that direction because uh, that's what Tolkien did, and it was fun. But, but it's not the only way. And lots of stories are told in other ways without that kind of frame. What's remarkable about this story is that it provides that kind of frame and then, like, disregards it, right? James, it's almost like we are invited to ask the question, so where, how do we know this, right? How did we get this story? Um, 
But James Stevens, I think you must be right. Only in silence the word. I think that's really the only answer, right? There we go. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for joining me. This was a really fun discussion. I know I kept us super long tonight, but it was totally worth it. Um, thank you for joining me on our journey here through Wizard of Earthsea. Don't forget, Out of the Silent Planet starting in January. Have a good holidays, everybody, and we'll be back for some uh, for another uh, fun short work of uh, classic imaginative fiction. C.S. Lewis is Out of the Silent Planet starting in January, and then thereafter we shall go to Morgoth's Ring, uh, Volume 10 of the History of Middle-Earth. Thanks, everybody. Good night, everybody. The Mythgard Academy has been offering in-depth discussions of awesome books and films since 2013, completely free to attend and free to download. If you've enjoyed our discussions and would like to help them continue, please consider donating at signumuniversity.org fund.